Members, I'm going to make a suggestion here for the benefit of everybody in the room, and that is if you are going to leave the room, can I suggest you go down through the public gallery and out through the double doors? Because every time these two doors open, that band's playing, uh, it's coming in at us. So. Sure, with all due respect, it was getting to shut the other doors into the, ah, thank the chamber. You. Thank you, I very much appreciate that, uh, uh, Councillor McKinney. So if we are leaving the room, it's probably best to go down through that way if we can. Okay, uh, I have an indication that we're ready to go. <clears throat> so, um, thanks for the patience of those we put in the, 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 the waiting room there. Um, and we are now back uh, live uh, online and out of confidential. So, without any further delay, we will go to the first uh, item for decision. LA 11 2018 0131F. Uh, recommendation there is to approve a Maliki is going to present and work us uh, through the report. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, members. Um, item one is LA 11 2018 f It's a fall plan application for the erection of agricultural shed for to be used as a milking parlour um, with associated underground slurry pit, two number of feed bins and associated site works. And the application is a retrospective application, and it's located at 85 metres east of 15 High Golden Road, Eglinton, and the recommendation is to approve. Um, the application site is uh, located outside the development limits of Eglinton Village, uh, um, as shown in the site, as outlined in red. Um, it is part of a, a larger farm complex that uh, straddles both sides of the Bally Golden Road. Um, so the, the, the actual shed is a retrospective application is built um, to, to, um, just to the, the south, um, southeast of the existing sheds within the farmyard at Bally Golden Road. And the images before you um, show the, the shed is traveling along the Bally Golden Road um, north towards uh, Eglinton Village. 
uh, and uh, there's this, this green shed here in the lower um, photograph here. Um, the block plan will show you the, the situation in, in relation to the existing agricultural sheds and nearby properties of Ballygoden Road. And uh, the, the elevations of the proposed the sort of the, the shed are shown here. Um, these are the side elevations. Um, you'll see that, the, that there's a, an overhang here um, because the eastern flank of the shed is open. As you see in the lower of, of the two images on this ele the side elevations. Uh, and all our three sides are enclosed. Uh, and the floor plan, uh, the hatched area is the, the slurry tank, uh, and you'll see the feed bins outside and some associated control rooms uh, associated with the, the, the milking mechanism for the milking parlour. So the, the relevant, relevant policy context is set out in the case officer report and set out here before you, the SPPS, the area plan, the PPS2, uh, in relation to natural heritage issues, PPS3 in relation to access, movement and parking, PPS15 in relation to planning, planning and flood risk, and PPS21 given the location of the, and nature of the development uh, in the countryside. Uh, a number of bodies were consulted in relation to the application, Northern Ireland Water have no objections. Uh, shared environmental services uh, have been consulted. Uh, and the potential impact has been assessed in relation to protected um, sites in accordance with the habitat regs. And it's been concluded and accepted by officers and recommendations that the proposal would not likely be, have a significant effect on the features of any European site. NIEA have no objections as the proposal will not have any significant adverse impact on protected features and species. Um, DFA roads have no objections subject to conditions. Environmental Health Service have considered noise over impacts and have no objections. DFA rivers have no objections and DERA have confirmed that the, the farm is active and established in respect of the policy to test set out in CTY 10 and CTY 13, sorry 12. Um, so in relation to the SBPS, uh, um, consideration has been given to proposal in relation to residential amenity. Uh, taking into account matters such as noise, odour, air quality and general disturbance and it's been concluded uh, that there will be no uh, detriment, significant detrimental impact on, on nearby properties. Um, PPS3 um, has, roads have been consulted, they have no issues in relation to access moving to their parking. Um, PPS2, um, we've consulted SES, NAEA, and there's been a number of reports submitted, and there's been no adverse impact on the natural environment. The HRA has been carried out, and it's been concluded that it'll have no significant effect on any features European sites. And PPS15, no issues in relation to flooding or drainage. Uh, an acceptable drainage assessment has been uh, submitted and assessed. So the, the main policy consideration into the, the, the principle uh, of an agricultural uh, building the countryside is set out in PPS 21 uh, within CTY 12. Um, there are a number of tests within CTY 12 uh, that uh, applicants must uh, demonstrate um, to the planning authority. Um, and it's been demonstrated that the, the, the farm holding has been active uh, uh, for more than six years, and this has been verified by DERA. Um, therefore, we're satisfied as an active and established agricultural holding. Um, we're satisfied that the milk parlour is necessary for long-term survival of the holding. The proposal will not be out of character in this rural location, and it will uh, uh, visually integrate into the landscape. It has no adverse impact on natural or built heritage, and there's no harmful impact from noise, pollution, or odour for nearby residents. Um, it has also been assessed that there are no existing buildings on the farm that could be used uh, instead because all the existing buildings are general purpose agricultural. No general purpose agricultural shed would be suitable for the specific use and function proposed. Um, in all applications in the countryside, we must take into uh, consideration CTY 13 uh, and 14 in relation to integration and uh, character. The site is located along a rural road uh, and it's uh, set uh, amongst an existing farm grouping. Um, 
use the application site there to plumb it and, and within a short, uh, mainly short distance views. Um, whilst there's no site boundary vegetation and it, the earth bond and larger field boundary vegetation will provide some level of the, uh, integration. Um, it's been considered that the size, nature and design of the bonds are in keeping with the, the existing rural character uh, of that part of the Bally Garden Road. Um, as you'll see in the, the original block plan, there's a number of other agricultural buildings uh, lo located in close proximity associated with this farm and our farm holdings. There's been more than five objections received. Uh, we've had 11 objections received from six different uh, households. And, and a number of issues uh, have been raised and are um, considered by officers. Um, the first two relate to flooding um, caused by the development and drainage system to uh, provide a bit of development. Some consideration of those points, officers would point out that the drainage assessment has been considered by DFA Rivers. And has been concluded that the development will not increase the, the risk of flooding. Um, the second uh, point of objection was with soil being dumped from the building works. Uh, it's been alleged that soil was transported from this site to another location. Uh, it is not considered that the removal of the soil is the, the breach of uh, plan control in terms of the development under consideration in this application. Uh, as summarised before, unfallen of our land is a separate matter and subject to separate enforcement case. Uh, there are no uh, enforcement notices at this site or at this location, uh, and the application is to retain uh, the development already carried out in terms of the, the built form, i.e. the, the Mulligan Parker and Shed. Um, the fourth point raised by objections is the potential environmental, environmental impact of the proposal. Consideration has been given to this. Uh, concerns have been raised that the application does not account for the potential impact of the proposal and development under consideration under L11 2017 uh, This is an application for 97 dwellings, approximately 200 metres to the north and west of the site. Um, the application was before planning committee and refused and is now subject to a planning appeal with the Planning Appeals Commission. As there is no approval on this site at present, there is no require, requirement to consider uh, these properties as sensitive receptors in terms of uh, impact uh, um, on odour at this point. Um, you may recall prior to the, the June planning committee, um, uh, some lit information was received. Uh, and, and just to, to cover that again and to clarify that issue that they the relate again to the, the unfall of land at another location. Um, the, it raises the issue relating to the use of soil from the application site being used in connection with one of rights and falling and raising of land within a floodplain. Um, the unfall is subject to a live and force notice. Um, you've been updated on that um, in confidential business. Um, so it, um, we're satisfied it would not be reasonable to a full permission pending the outcome of that enforcement case. So in summary, uh, having considered all material considerations, including the SPPS, the area plan, um, PPS2, PPS3, PPS15, PPS21, uh, all relevant plan history, consultations and um, representations, um, officers uh, would recommend approval um, for the application before you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Maliki. Uh, members, we do have a speaker, however, um, and we are going to hear this particular application out. However, I, I must apologise, uh, and I will actually have to roll back after we've come to a decision on this one because we neglected to do the minutes and matters arising from the previous minutes. Um, and uh, quite a number of us perhaps didn't notice that. Um, there, there is such a thing as having too much paperwork in front of you. Uh, but can I thank uh, Councillor Dobbins for um, drawing my, my attention to that particular matter in particular. So um, we'll come back to that after we've moved through this one, members, uh, no harm done. So we have do have one speaker um, uh, on behalf of the applicant. Um, if I'm not mistaken, this is the applicant, uh, and it's Marilyn uh, Jameson. So, Marilyn, you're very welcome, and uh, thank you for joining us here this afternoon. And uh, if you'd like to give us your presentation now, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you. Um, yes, my name is Marilyn Jameson, and I'm here to represent the Jameson family who has submitted this planning application. So, we thank you for the opportunity to speak today. 
I would also like to thank Mr. McCarran, who, in our opinion, has prepared a very comprehensive, detailed, and accurate professional planning report. I want to take just a few minutes of your time to provide a bit of context for this planning application and give it a bit of heart. So I'd like to make just three points. Firstly, it can't have escaped your notice this is a retrospective planning application. The agricultural shed to which it refers was built in 2016. However, it was 2013 that we first conceived of the idea of building a state-of-the-art dairying unit. It was to replace the very old and existing one, which was no longer suitable. The new shed would incorporate the most up-to-date ideas regarding animal fit welfare. And because we were replacing the old shed and planning to build adjacent to it, we actually didn't realize that planning permission was required as it was a like-for-like -like replacement. Now, I know now how incredible that must sound. However, in our defense, we worked with an agricultural engineer who has built several farm sheds in the area, and he never mentioned planning permission to us. In addition, during the design phase, we sought the input of two professional advisors from Remount Agricultural College, one whose remit was to support farmers who were building new agricultural sheds, and neither of them mentioned planning permission. And finally, the bank, who was and still is a major investor in this project, never said anything about planning permission, and it appears that this is not a requirement to secure the very significant funding that we've had to seek. We only started to hear that planning permission might have been required after 2016 when the shed had been built. So yes, we are naive and we were ignorant of the planning requirements, but we want you to know that this was not down to a flagrant disregard for the planning law and the regulations, but rather a total lack of understanding. The second point I want to make concerns the environment. And there's a lot of talk these days about how tree planting can mitigate against the emissions from farm enterprises. So we would like to point out that we implemented a tree planting program on our farm 30 years ago. We currently have the most amazing stand of mature indigenous Irish hardwood trees. We took professional advice all those years ago, suitable fields were identified and would in time provide habitats for all sorts of wildlife amongst other benefits. And in the end, 25 acres or 20% of the farm was turned over into a deciduous forest. This forest sits adjacent to a glen and an ancient woodland. It, and it sits just uphill from the farm buildings. And it's a pity that this beautiful reforested area um, isn't recognized as having a positive environmental effect. By the way, if you're ever traveling along the Dairy to Limavady Road, um, just after the blue pedestrian bridge outside Eglinton, if you were to look up to the hills to the right, you will see a beautiful area of forest that is particularly spectacular in the autumn. My third and final point concerns the farm and the farming business. This is a generational farm. Jamesons have lived and farmed it for over 300 years, and so it has been passed down. My husband has always said that he and all previous generations have never regarded themselves as owners of the land, but as custodians. And with that perspective, there's a responsibility to ensure that the land is treated well, not overstocked and left in as good a state as possible for succeeding generations. For at least 80 years, this farm has been an active dairy farm with the exception of a 10 year period when beef was the main enterprise. The number of animals that has been kept on the farm has been fairly consistent over this time. We are, of course, very remorseful that planning permission was not acquired prior to the building of the agricultural shed. However, we are pleased that through this process, all the statutory bodies who have assessed every aspect of the farm and its daring enterprise have found it to be acceptable. And we are pleased that Mr. McCarran is recommending approval of our application to you today. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Marilyn. Uh, if you'd just like to hold on, uh, I'm going to put it open to the members uh, who may well wish to ask you some questions. Uh, Alderman Kerrigan, you're the first man to indicate. Go ahead. Thank you very much, Chair, for allowing me in. And I do thank Ms. Jamison for her uh, presentation. Uh, just, just a couple of queries there in regards to it. Um, you have stated there you've been milking now or for approximately 80 years, with the exception of 10 years in the middle there. And uh, I'm just confirming there, 
what what uh, what have you put up in this shade? I mean, are we chatting? Uh, have you went to the project of? I mean, it's down as a milk and parlour according to this. As this, have you went for robots? Have you went for rotary? Have you went for? Uh, are we talking a six, a twelve, uh, an eighteen point kind of parlour uh, with a putt? Or uh, you know, it's it's there's not as much detail just there. I'm just trying to confirm what's there. Is it a covered collecting yard with cubicles? Is in this shade? I mean, looking at it there, it's eight bays long. It's not, it's not massive. It's a good size building there, but where I'm looking at it here is, is uh, you're averaging out there approximately 110 cows going through, uh, according to this here, which I, I'm minded, I don't know how many acres you've got there, but you're not working it on a, an industrial scale. You know, I mean, the average dairy herds there are approximately, in Northern Ireland, are approximately 125. So, so it's just the case that you're you're uh, you're not you're not overstocking the ground here, uh, according to this here. Where my kind of read out on it here. So, I'm just querying, what have you put in place here in this shade? As I say, it's just down as a milk and parlour with. Uh, there's not as much detail on the wee plan there, but I'm querying what you've done there. What had you beforehand? I mean, are we talking about? Sorry about that. Like a wee, a wee, like a wee buyer with a six-point parlour on each side. What, what was there? What have you, uh, you've done? I know myself. I mean, uh, well, it depends what you're going to tell me, but I would have no uh, doubt there is substantial investment uh, in regards to that. There's substantial money. I mean, I've, I've worked with dairy farmers, and, and there's substantial money pumped into done a parlour and I think to do with um, you, you know the slabs there and it's not block built pots or uh, uh, tanks anymore uh, and there's a lot of investment underground before you put anything on top so just a couple of them we queries if you come back to me and then I can see then if I have another wee point. Thank you Ms. Jameson. Right. Go ahead there. Go ahead Barbara. Sorry, um, the, the existing shed, uh, the old shed was a, a 12 point swing over parlor in a shed that would have um, been built 50, maybe 60 years ago. Um, and 85 to 90 cows were put through that the old milking parlor. Um, it was, it had a, a low roof, which in today's um, thinking for animal welfare is is not acceptable for the free flow of air and to um, limit the number of bacterial and, and viral infections that animals can pick up in a low roofed building. What has been, but has replaced it is um, there are two robotic um, milking stations. Um, and yes, we were pleased that uh, SES said that we could have 110 cows in it, and the shed is built to for that capacity. But um, certainly, that is in the short term not the uh, idea. Where at the moment there are 95 milking cows, and that's kind of the limit that we see it at the moment, um, because it is a one-man operation. It's my son's. To go beyond that, he feels he would then have to. Um, employ somebody else um, to help him with it if it was beyond the 95. Um, and it's 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 a case of um, economies of scale, whether if we go bigger, is it worthwhile having an additional person? The shed itself is is um, cubicles, well spaced cubicles. Um, again, um, we were helped with the design from the people from Greenmount Agricultural College. Um, the animals are put out to paddock and the summer months um, and then they wander back in um, to go through the, the robotic milking systems as and when they please. Um, in the winter time, they are housed within this shed and there is a feeding face um, on the north facing wall um, where they can access their, their silage. Um, the shed is big, it's airy, there are the cubicles are spacious. Um, and the animals are um, very content within that. Now, I don't know if that answers all the questions that you have. Um, the farm is also um, being assessed by Red Tractor, which is um, a, a body that makes sure that everything is um, 
of a, of a very high standard, um, particularly with animal welfare, and is also registered with the, I'm not sure what the new name of it is, it used to be called the, the Meat and Livestock Commission, but I think it might be the Livestock and Meat Commission now, I'm not sure. The farmers registered with both those bodies. I hope that answers the main yep. body of your questions. Yep, that's fine. Can you keep it brief? Yeah, very, very briefly, Chair, very briefly. No, th th uh, I do thank you for, for your response. And I do note, that, as you say, it is open to the one side there. As I say, it would be they would often say that it's more environmentally friendly or uh, better for the animals, letting in more air into the, into the site. So, no, that's that verified that. So, no, I'm, I'm content enough there. And as I say, those uh, robotic parlors. I know the cost of them, and, and you've got two machines in there, and they are stating that you're averaging out about 60 cows per machine. So if you're sitting about 95 there, you're not putting too much pressure on animals with that. So I can see it's more the welfare end of things. So, no, thank you very much for your response. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman. Any other questions from members? Um, Councillor Dobbins on uh, the chat there. Uh, yeah. Councillor Dobbins, go ahead. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, <clears throat> thanks very much, Marilyn, for that. Uh, unlike the previous speaker, all I know about dairy farming is that it concerns bovine with others. And we've come on from a stool in a bucket to collect the milk. But um, I would like to say this, Marilyn, and I mean this most sincerely, as, as someone who absolutely detests retrospective planning um, and some of the attitudes that come with it from, from applicants, um, I do 100% appreciate the, your sincerity and somewhat apologetic reasoning for doing so. And I wish to commend you on that. Um, it's not very often we get the chance to, to do this, but I'm doing it here. Um, totally accept your reasoning behind uh, for building it and, and then seeking um, planning approval. So appreciate that, Marlon. Just needed, I needed to say that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Dobbins. Um, uh, I have again in the chat box here, Councillor Kelly. Councillor Kelly, are you hearing us okay? I'm inviting you in here. Thank you, Chair. Apologies. Yeah, um, and thanks to Ms. Jameson for, for that um, additional information. I, I do have a question, Chair, and it's, uh, I suppose, um, based on uh, lots of the press reports over the last maybe just even 24 hours or so uh, around um, nutrient plans uh, that have been presented to planning authorities. In fact, that uh, there's no investigations north and south of the border, I understand, uh, into what are falsified documents that are being um, presented to uh, local planning authorities in order to get um, applications over the line. Now, I'm not suggesting for a minute that's the case here, but in terms of, of due diligence, I have looked at the nutrient plan that was submitted, and I'm just I'm wondering, would Ms. Jameson maybe just say a wee bit around the fact that um, the contract is indicated for three to five years, and I'm just curious to know what would be, I suppose, maybe the longer term um, plan for, for nutrient management on the site beyond that of the contract that's indicated uh, within the, the nutrient plan. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Kelly. Thanks for your question. Um, uh, Marilyn, I'll give you the opportunity to uh, respond to that. But... Right, thank you. Um, originally, yes, um, our... Um, the slurry would have been exported um, further away um, and in association with just um, logistics, we sought places closer to home. The three nutrient management plans that um, we submitted are farms that are and locations that are very close to or adjacent to um, our own. Um, and although the commitment, um, the contract is says between three and five years, um, the farms uh, that we have arranged, that, 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 that was the legal requirement for the nutrient management plan, uh, was to secure um, places for a, 
a minimum, a three to five year minimum. It's, we would envisage actually that not to change at all because of the neighbors that we have um, secured the arrangements with are older people who are quite happy to comply with those arrangements that we've made. Uh, we would see that very much as long term arrangements that we have now put in place and we're much happier with those arrangements than with the ones that we have previously. Um, so I don't see that, um, although it says three to five years, as a family, we would envisage that that's a much uh, more of a long-term arrangement. Really appreciate that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Kelly. Any other comments, any questions um, for Ms. Jamison? Thank you. I thank you, Ms. Jamison. We're going to move on now, members. Are there any comments or questions uh, for our officer, Maliki? Alderman Kerrigan. Right, very briefly. Um, I suppose there's one that I'll, I'll ask you. Is there, is there uh, how tight is condition number two going to be there? I'm just wondering, you know. If it falls out that additional ground is, is, is bought or anything in that regard, and they are in a position to increase the dairy size, is that something that they would have to come back in with a fresh application for? I'm just querying that one. Yes, uh, well, condition number two has been uh, recommended um, by Shared Environmental Services and also by um, Natural Environment Division of NIEA. Uh, and they see it as, a, as an important condition uh, in relation to um, ammonia emissions. So yes, we, we, we would have viewed it, you know, that that condition should stand. However, as per all applications, if a condition is uh, applied um, to an approval, there's a legislative uh, allowance under section 54 for an applicant to apply to uh, vary or remove the condition and that we consider it on its own merits then. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody in the chat? No. Okay, members. So I'm going to move it uh, forward from here. Uh, there is a recommendation uh, to approve and I'll take uh, proposals now. Alderman Kerrigan. Chair, I'm content to propose to accept the officer's recommendation. And I'll second that. So, a proposal from uh, Alderman Kerrigan, seconded. Uh, thank you, Alderman Bresland. Uh, members, <coughs> I'm going to put that to the floor now. That's the proposal in front of you. Um, uh, and we're going to have to do the read through here for the benefit of uh, the record of sorts. Maura. Thank you, Chair. Um, members, this is a recorded vote for item one, and it's in order to um, accept the officer's recommendation to approve. Alderman Alan Breslin. For. Thanks. Alderman Keith Kerrigan. Alderman Drew Thompson, as apologies. Councillor Jason Barr, as for. apologies. For. Thanks. Apologies. Apologies there, Jason. Councillor Raymond Barr. He's not here. Councillor John Boyle. Or. Thank you. Councillor Angela Dobbins. Or Maura. Thanks. Councillor Paul Gallagher. Or. Thanks, Paul. Councillor Christopher Jackson. Or Maura. Thank you. Councillor Dan Kelly. For Maura. Thank you. Councillor Patricia Logue. For. Councillor Kieran Maguire. Apologies. Councillor Philip McKinney. For. Thank you. And Councillor Sean Mooney. For. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, members. Um, uh, and I think uh, we can record that as a unanimous decision in favour of the approval. Uh, so that. Um, uh, application has now been passed, approved, uh, LA 11 2018 f Thank you, um, Ms. Jamison, for uh, joining us uh, here this afternoon, and uh, hopefully uh, I'm fairly sure that uh, decision will meet with your approval. So again, thank you. Members, we're just going to roll back.
slightly. Again, as I indicated, two items uh, six and seven. Um, so item number six, matters arising from the open minutes of the planning committee meeting held on Wednesday the 8th of June uh, 2022. Are there any matters arising, uh, members? None indicated, thank you. And finally, matters arising for the open minutes of the re reconvened planning committee meeting held on Thursday the 9th of June 2022. Any matters arising in relation to those? Thank you, members. That's that formality dealt with. And again, apologies for that. Um, so we will move forward now to the next item uh, for decision, which is item three on our agenda, uh, and it's LA 11 2022 0278F. And again, recommendation here is to refuse. Uh, and Andre is going to present the report and work our way through it on our behalf. Andre. Thank you, Chair. Um, good afternoon, members. So item three is LA 11 2022 0278F. Um, the proposal is a section 54 application to develop land without complying with condition 23, seeking removal of condition requiring the retention of existing single glazed Georgian multi-plane putty fronted hardwood slide, sliding sash windows to the listed building, except those identified as being removed in accordance with the stamp approved drawings and condition 24, seeking removal of the requirement that new windows shall be glazed Georgian multi-paned putty fronted hardwood sliding sash windows. Um, and that relates to plan and permission LA 11 2017 0862F. Um, and this um, site is located at the former Ebrington Barrack site, um, including buildings 63, 79 and 60, 70, 69, known as the Clock Tower um, in Ebrington. And the recommendation is to refuse. So members, the site is located on the eastern side of the Ebrington Square, fronting onto the parade ground and backing onto the Starfort Wall, um, which is a scheduled monument. The application site contains three Grade B2 listed buildings. Building 67 to 69 is known as the Clock Tower Building and is a three-storey Georgian building located centrally fronting onto the parade ground. Building 63, um, the former officers' quarters and captain's house, is a two-storey white rendered Georgian building, which also fronts onto the parade ground. And Building 79 is a two-storey red brick building located to the rear of Building 63. So members, this slide shows an aerial image of the wider Ebrington site with the buildings contained within the red line. Uh, the Clock Tower Building and Building 63 are prominent key landmark buildings within the Ebrington site, which have their front elevation facing onto Ebrington Square and can be viewed from the city side under the approach um, to Ebrington site via the Peace Bridge. The Clock Tower is one of the most important buildings within the square and the wider Ebrington site, given its location and elevation facing into the space, as well as its individual architect architectural integrity in its own right. So, members of the Planning Committee granted planning approval and an associated list of building consent for the refurbishment and extension and change of use of these listed buildings on the site to create a 152 bedroom hotel in June 2018 and work has commenced on the site. So planning conditions 23 and 24 were attached to the decision um, notice to approve um, and they stipulated that um, condition 23 that the existing single glazed Georgian multi paned putty fronted hardwood sliding sash windows shall be retained to all three listed buildings, building 63, building 67, 68, 69 and building 79, except for those windows identified as removed in accordance with the stamped approved drawings. And the reason was to protect the essential character and setting of the listed building. And condition 24, which stated new window openings as identified on the drawings to buildings 67, 68 and 69, shall be single glazed Georgian multi-pane putty fronted hardwood sliding sash windows to match those found in the listed building. And the reason was to protect the essential character and setting of the listed buildings. So this um, is a block plan of the approved development with existing buildings in black and the new build extensions colour grey. So this application um, in front of members today is a section, four, section 54 application to remove conditions 23 and 24. And the applicant is proposing that the new window openings in the grade B2 list of buildings, building 67 to 69 known as Clock Tower building, 
are fitted with new UPVC sliding sash windows. So further detail regarding um, the window openings in all buildings, including all those to be retained and those to be replaced with UBVC, um, is contained um, in detail in the case officer report. In relation to the clock tower building, um, all windows, um, which number 50 in total on the front elevation, are proposed to be fitted with um, UPVC sliding sash. The rear elevations take account of the approved extension to the rear, and as a result, some existing windows and structures to the side and rear will be removed or blocked up. So five windows in the rear elevation are proposed to be fitted with new UBVC sliding sash, and a further five new openings are to be formed um, with PVC windows. Um, a number of existing structures to the rear are to be removed um, as part of the earlier approval, and 25 windows are to be removed and the openings blocked up. So seven windows are to be retained, obscure glazed and blocked up behind, and three new UPVC windows are proposed on the side elevations. The removal and blocking up of the windows, um, as I said, to the rear and side is accepted as this is detailed in the development as granted under the 2017 hotel permission. The main issue um, is that the permission was granted subject to the conditions that the windows to be retained and those to be replaced were to be single glazed Georgian hardwood sliding sash windows. And the applicant now proposes that all windows um, should be fitted with UPVC sliding sash windows. So members, this slide just shows the side elevation of the clock tower building. So given the fact that the, this application affects grade B2 listed buildings and there is an associated listed building consent application, officers consulted with Historic Environment Division during the processing of the application. So HED advised in their consultation response that the proposal shall have a significant adverse impact on the list of buildings and the proposal would therefore be contrary to planning policy statement six, especially policies BH8 and BH11 and to the SPPS. And three reasons for refusal were provided on the consultation response. So no objections from third parties were received during the processing of the application. Um, and members will be aware in your packs today of a late item received by Council on the 1st of July um, from Mark Durkin MLA stating that he welcomes the long overdue development of the site and believes the hotel will greatly enhance tourism and the local economy. He shares the applicant's view that timber single glazed windows are not appropriate for hotel bedrooms and that in his view the multiple benefits of this application outweigh the concerns as raised by officers in HED. So, members, policy consideration um, is just detailed on this slide, um, and the policy includes the dairy area plan, the SPPS and PPS6. Um, the full policy consideration is set out in detail in the planning report. Um, the windows and the list of building, um, in officer's opinion, plays a vital role in the overall appearance and character of the building, um, both internally as well as externally. So appropriate historic designed windows, including the material they're constructed from, contribute to the aesthetic and historic integrity of listed buildings and are an important element in retaining um, the character across both this building and the wider Ebrington complex um, through group value. Officers in HED consider that the insertion of factory-made modern standard UPVC, even in a sliding sash style, is damaging to the character and appearance of historic buildings. The applicant's reasons for requesting the removal of the conditions and proposing UBVC windows in the list of buildings are summarised in the officer's planning report. So in conclusion, members, um, it is considered that the removal of conditions 23 and 24 of LA 11 2017-0862 would significantly alter the essential character and special interest of these listed buildings. There is also concern for the potential of this application, if granted, to create a new precedent in what is deemed an appropriate window type within a listed building on a regional and national level. The Clock Tower building is a very important key landmark building within the Ebrington site, which has its front elevation facing onto Ebrington Square um, and can be viewed from the city side and on approach to Ebrington via the Peace Bridge. It is one of the most important buildings within the square and the wider Ebrington site, given its location and elevation as well as its own architectural integrity. 
Therefore, the proposal is considered unacceptable in that it would have an adverse, um, significant adverse impact on the list of buildings and is contrary to the policies as listed previously. Officers that therefore recommend refusal of the application for the reasons as set out below. Um, and members, I just wanted to advise that we have invited Dermot Madden, who is Historic Environment Division. Um, if there's any questions from members later in the discussing the application, thank you. Thank you, Andre. Um, members, uh, we have a couple of speakers here um, in relation to uh, this. Um, we have uh, Harry McConnell, the agent for the application, uh, and also online with Cecil uh, Doherty, the applicant. Uh, gentlemen, you're very welcome. Thank you for joining us uh, this afternoon. And so, if you'd like to uh, take the opportunity now to uh, present to the committee, um, I invite you to do so. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, members. Um, my name is Harry McConnell from RPP Architects, and I'm joined by Cecil Doherty, who is representing Everything Leisure Holdings, uh, which is limited, which is our client on this. Um, I suppose the first thing I would say to you is that initially this looks like a very simple decision, um, but the reasons why we're asking you to take this decision are not simple. Um, and if you permit me, I'd like to just give you a brief recap uh, on why we're in front of you today. Um, one point I would make initially, or would make initially, is that the building was actually, and the buildings in question were actually listed with new VP PVC windows in them at the time of listing. The current um, single glazed putty windows were actually added as part of the City of Culture preparations, and they were taking off a simple single template and weren't measured individually for the size of the openings that were subsequently there. Um, in 2015, September 2015, uh, Cecil Doherty and myself met on site, and it was at that point that we felt that the position for a hotel within the master plan had to be along the frontage of um, Everington Square with the view out towards the city and the square itself. Um, we completed our initial hotel design concepts uh, by January of 2016, and we had our initial costings by August 2016. Uh, we entered into a planning application and extensive discussions with HED, and those were carried out in good faith. And at the time that we made the application, our intention was uh, to do exactly what we said on the tin. And up until this point, that's exactly what we are doing. And unfortunately for us, um, we, uh, after getting planning approval, we went to tender and we had our tenders back in June, or sorry, I beg your pardon, our tenders were back um, in March 2019. And at that point, it was clear that we had a funding gap for what we wanted to do and the tenders had come back in and what we had the funding available to do so. At that point, our investors and our clients um, went out back into the market along with ourselves in terms of looking at uh, value engineering um, to bring the project back on uh, schedule. Unfortunately, just before we thought we had that resolved, we were hit with a pandemic in March 2020. Um, and hand on heart, for me at that point, while the investors were very still very bullish about the project, I myself thought that it was unlikely to go ahead. And I have to say, if the investors were not local, I think that was very likely to be the case. Um, we were um, engaged throughout that period. And in June 2021, we were back speaking to contractors, um, having done a further value engineering um, with a view to starting the project and getting on site uh, by September of that year, by September 2021. We re-engaged with the contractors. And in September 21, we had a new um, tender price. We had new funding arrangements in place and we were ready to go on site. Um, unfortunately, the works that were required, the SIB were required to do to the buildings, in particular the rebuilding of a couple of the gables because of structural issue concerns delayed us getting on site until um, January 2022. In the intervening period, it was clear after we fixed the tender price with the contractor, the pricing in the market was still increasing. And in December, we further looked at other options that potentially we could look at to keep us on track. Um, unfortunately, by that point, um, the first of the Bank of Ireland's, uh, or sorry, Bank of England's uh, rate rises hit us in December, but we took possession of the site in January. And as you can see, work is progressing. 
We made this application in February, the 19th of February this year, um, against the backdrop of continuing price rises within the construction industry. And on the 24th of February this year, Russia invaded Ukraine. And since that date, we are suffering intense increases across all materials, across all materials. Um, and I just wanted to give you sort of a, a little bit of an idea of the backdrop for that. Um, we've made a Section 54 application uh, to remove the condition for us to uh, install the single glazed windows. Um, the, as you can imagine, the single glazed windows at the time they were installed for the City of Culture was for gallery spaces. Um, but what we are putting in is residential with heating and cooling, um, and they're just not appropriate in terms of the energy consumption. So on top of that, we would be fitting then a requirement for secondary glazing in behind to meet with building control, um, to deal with condensation, and to deal with all the other things that if people um, are aware of uh, with single glazed windows. As I say, we made the initial discussions in good faith, um, and we are not seeking forgiveness, we are seeking permission. So we've come in front of you today. Um, we have included within the report about 60 pages of price increases. I'm not asking anyone to read uh, all of those, but I think it's fair to say that everyone is aware of where price increases have been, particularly in the last four months. But in construction, 2021 was significant increases for us with lack of labor, uh, 21, 22 now, it has just been incredible. And the last four months in the construction market, if it's steel, if it's timber, if it's insulation, if it's anything related to petroleum, and whether that's plastics or anything else, the increases have been substantial. For Excuse our me, point- Mr. McConnell, oh, I'm sorry, but your five yeah. minutes speaking rights allocation is now complete. Thank you. I don't know if- All right, all right, there with me. All right I'll, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of leeway, but please don't- uh, um, Take, uh, be given an inch and take a mile, so um, uh, I'll let you finish up, but please do try to be brief on it. Um, I, I suppose, Chair, thank you. What I'd like to finish by saying is that in the time period between September and December of last year, while the ongoing SIB works were carried out, SIB facilitated some further visits to the site. And in that, we determined, and we can provide photographic uh, evidence or would indeed invite councillors if they so wish, to go and see that the windows that were submitted and the windows that were being asked to retain do not fit the openings for which they're put into and there are significant gaps all around them. Um, uh, so what we will be tasked with doing if we have to is to actually fabricate new timber single glazed windows to replace those that are existing um, because we'll need to do that to ensure that they fit. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, there are May well be a few questions um, for yourself and the applicant here, uh, and the first indicated uh, speaker is Councillor Jackson. Thank, thanks, Chair, and I suppose I, I want to thank Harry, but I, I, I want to point out that this, uh, at the very outset, it was very difficult to hear, um, and I was very interested to hear what, what Harry had to say, but I, I was I couldn't make out quite a lot of what he said. Um, and that's and hence the question. Um, am I right in picking them up that um, that the, there was PVC wonders that were previously installed, and they were replaced by the wooden wonders that are now in place for setting a culture? Um, am I right in in, in my and that I've had come up right, and I, and I think one of the things that we need to sort of go back and and what I would like to point out is that I think we all recognise the importance uh, and and the prominent location that that this this building has, particularly within Everton Square. Um, I think this committee was was very um, excited to see the the. the the full application come in and been approved. Um, and one of the one of the elements that I, I find this committee were very keen on was to retain the historic fabric of the building whilst incorporating a modern element to it. And it was and it, the balance was just right. Um, I, 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 well, I, from my, my or from my perspective, anyway, whenever. Um, the application came before this committee. I, I, I just 
wanted that wee bit of clarity. I, I would have quite a lot of sympathy with the applicant, um, given the fact that the applicant decided they they come to the committee, um, and 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 as as I said, seek permission or and seek for forgiveness. I might have further questions for the representative from HED, and it's great to hear they have them here. But I just wanted that wee bit of clarity around. Um, the replacement of the the, the old uh, PVC wonders that were there, and, and, I, and I wanted to make the point that there was quite a lot um, that we heard or we didn't hear from from the applicant in that regard, and it's in that case it's disappointing. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, uh, Councillor Jackson. So I hope that you heard that question, uh, Harry um, uh, Cecil. So. Uh, if you'd like to come back on that. All right. That was a question for you. Apologies. Come back with it. Yeah, apologies, Chair. I, I missed part of that, but I, I think I got the first part of the question. So, yes, at the time that the buildings were with PVC windows in place. Um, the windows that were added were added um, as part of the City of Culture preparations when the buildings were being used as um, meeting and as exhibition space. If there's Jim. All right, sorry, I regret to say you're kind of breaking up a little bit. Perhaps if yeah. Cecil could answer for me, Chair. So I say that again? If the applicant would like to answer that question, maybe he's got a better line. Um, can you everybody hear me? Yep, yep, go ahead, go ahead, Cecil. Yeah, um, the, the building was listed with uh, PVC windows in situ. Uh, windows were then fitted for the City of Culture, and they did one measurement fits all. So as a result, all the openings are not the same. It's an 1840s building. None, no two windows are the same. So they put in windows that ill fit right across the whole thing. Uh, and that's the problem now, because we're looking at spending 15 million developing an international uh, tourism uh, footfall into the city with single glazed windows. Uh, um, you know, and you talk about, you know, the carbon footprint, you talk about all those elements today, and we're sitting saying to American visitors, yes, you can stay in the clock tower, but it's single glazing, and we have to turn temperature up to 30 degrees to be able to, to maintain some sort of body temperature in those rooms. It's 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 not acceptable. Um, and Harry just made the point there. I'm going to, if, if Chair, and by the way, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to talk to you. And if you give me one minute, I'll just present some arguments to you, if you don't mind, if, if that's appropriate. Um, yeah, that's Harry, go ahead. Yeah, Harry mentioned that if we were uh, inward investors in this city, and I read all the papers and I hear all the, the information about looking to seek investment into the city, well, we're locals investing 15 million pounds in the city. We're going to create over 120 jobs. We're going to bring in international visitors from all over. Our marketing plan is extensive and costly. We're going to do that for the city because we're committed to doing that. I would also point out that we respect heritage, but we're actually preserving heritage by giving it a new lease of life. If you consider, folks, that the clock tower, had it sat as it was for another four or five years, may well have fallen given the bad condition that it was in. In order to, to preserve a standing still, a million and a half pounds was spent in the clock tower to preserve it. We are now adding to that. So a couple of other points, you know, as I said, we're, we're, we're committed. We haven't run away from this. You know, it was started out at 11 and a half million. It's now 15 million in a standing start, none of which is our fault. We haven't changed the design. We're, we're taking aging buildings, we're preserving them, we're enhancing them, and we're going to create a, a facility for this city with an international reputation for excellence. It's a, it's a facility that, yes, is fronting onto the river. Yes, is on uh, Arlington Square. But it's also a facility that we will create that will make the city proud of it. And, and people will come in and be proud of what we're about to do. And what I'm saying to you, yes, the legislation is this. And it's easy, as Harry says, to follow the legislation, accept refusal, and we all move on. 
But it isn't that simple because we're left with this. We're left with the reality of the overspend. We're left with the reality that we may not be able to materialize the plans that we have. These are exceptional circumstances. They require your support right now. Single glazing in today's world is absurd. We are proactively protecting our heritage and we're asking you today to be brave. We read the papers, everyone talks about carbon neutral and job creation. We're doing both. Your decision today will be instrumental in the future of that hotel and that entity for this city. And irrespective of national or international uh, regulation, these are exceptional times that, ex that requires bravery from you, the members, to have the foresight to support what we're trying to do. And as I offer to the heritage people and to the planners, we will be more than willing to bring you councillors over to show you the job that we're doing. Happy to share our marketing material with you. We're, we're happy to, we're up front. We're not hiding. We need your support. We need you to be brave today. This saving today is only part of a massive value engineering that we've engaged in to try and save the project. We're here every day, seven days a week. We ask you to be brave and I ask you to make that decision on the, on the basis of what's good for this city. We will protect the clock tower. We will protect it. I promise you that. We respect heritage. So please do the right thing today for us and we will make the city proud of what we're going to build. Uh, thank you, Mr. Doherty. Um, does that adequately answer your question, Councillor Jackson? I think it does, yes, indeed. Uh, members, uh, I have in the chat box Councillor Dobbins, Angela, and then I'll come to you, Councillor McKinney. Thank you, Councillor Chair. Dobbins. Thank you. Um, what I don't... <laughs> right. You were aware of the conditions? Um, from uh, the Councillor Dobbins, we're finding it extremely difficult to hear you. All right, seriously. So you can maybe address something at your end there. Yeah. It's extremely difficult to hear you. Okay, well, there's no problem at this end. I haven't moved or anything else. Can you hear me now? Uh, we're hearing you, Grant. Now, Angela, right. it's just we've, we, we've got a jazz band here as well to contend with. It's not necessarily just your fault. Right. Go ahead, Angela. Right. Um, my, You were aware, Harry, of uh, the conditions uh, put on first, as, as the previous speaker, Christopher, had actually said, we're proud of our heritage. We're very proud of our heritage. And the, and the reason you got um, approval from the beginning was that uh, conditions were put, which were accepted, that um, the, the sash type windows would be retained and kept there um, to, to keep that um, the, the building's character uh, and that was paramount from the onset. Um, I, I do understand we've had a bit pandemic, um, but so has all our businesses, and some businesses have had to close, which is what we personally don't want you to do. You know, we don't want that to happen. But at the same time, I'm not, um, I, I'm not comfortable with losing um, the the character of that building. You know, because we. I had, and I was one of them, um, made it quite clear at the beginning. Now, uh, the shortages of supplies is um, throughout this land uh, and and the, the war with Russia, you know, it's not it's not the city's fault either. I know it's not yours, but it's not the city's fault either. Uh, and I, for one, would like the retention of, of that Baldwin's character kept. Um, I... I, I just caught the end, Harry, of what you had said with regard to doing the, the wooden sash windows uh, and single glaze, that they would have to be remade. Um, can I just ask, what's the reason why you aren't doing that? Um, Councillor Dobbins, um, apologies for my connection. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. Um, you're correct. The, the we did enter into good faith discussions with both HED and planning service, and they were protracted. And you, you're correct to recall that there was a significant challenge in bringing the design of this forward. Um, we entered into those in good faith, but where we sit at the minute is a hotel that we had planned to build in Derry, which we had estimated 
a construction cost of somewhere between 11 and 12 million, which now, as you point out, is nobody's fault, is now costing 15 million. During the period that the SIB were in doing the corrective works, when we were facilitated access, it was apparent at that stage, which wasn't apparent from the externals, that the windows that had been fitted were not fitted to in individual openings. So that there are large gaps of upwards of four to five inches around the windows, which we're more than happy for councillors to go in and to look yourselves. The cost of the replacement of the timber glazed windows with the secondary glazing that we would need to put in. So we can't only have the single glazed windows for building control and the points that Cecil made in terms of heat loss. So we have to install a secondary glazing system behind that, which isn't unusual on some very high end um, listed buildings, but it's a cost that we have not costed for. So as it stands at the minute, the cost of the project is around 150,000 pounds additional, and we've provided evidence for that. In relation to your point, which is an important point, which is about the, the area. So there are a number of windows already on the square, which no doubt will be replaced or will be asked to be replaced, which are currently PVC, um, white PVC sliding sash windows, which may be replaced by timber, whether double glazed or single glazed. But we believe that that PVC window and the window that we're proposing, which we've included in the pack as the type, won't be detrimental to the to the appearance of the building. But as I say, Councillor Dobbins, you're entirely right. We did enter into this in good faith. We had an excellent, if at times, um, heated discussions um, with HED and with planning. But we came out of the end of it with an, an agreement and a compromise and one that we were very excited about. Um, and we are doing everything possible that we can to stick to those, to stick to that requirements, to the glazing designs, to the bricks, to, to everything in terms of the scope and, of the application. But in this instance, this is 150,000 pounds, which after three years of cost savings and looking at the interiors, because that's primarily where these cost savings are have to come from, it's 150,000 pounds that we cannot find. Thank you. Uh, hold on. Uh, Councillor Dobbins, uh, you can temp with that? No. Um, no, Chair. Come back to us, Councillor Dobbins. Yes, I am. And can you hear me now? Yeah, just yeah. Go, just about. Go ahead. Okay. Um, Harry, why was this not discovered? You see those gaps where the, the heating can come out of and the windows not fit for purpose? Why were they not discovered at the initial um, when you did the inspection before even the the for the first planning application? Like, why was this not discovered? Why is it only discovered now? It's it's a fair question, um, Councillor Dobbins. Um, at the time, obviously, when we went back in along with SIB there were substantial works that were being undertaken inside the building and the access that we were afforded was a lot better. At the time that we went into the building, um, there were no floors in the building. Um, there were some wall finishes uh, that were put in, um, but our access um, was not, uh, wasn't as complete as we would have liked. There were other items within there that we subsequently didn't pick up, which were picked up. Um, for instance, and the applications, I believe, came forward to the council last year, two of the gables were in significant distress and likely to collapse. And those applications to rebuild, demolish and rebuild those gables had to be brought in. Um, there were substantial issues with the structural frame in terms of the joists that were there were not adequately fixed to the external of the walls. So those works have had to be undertaken by us, um, although they were identified by SIB. There have been substantial steel work uh, reinforcement that was required um, because none of the walls were stitched into the uh, the long walls. So there are steel work brackets which are fitted throughout the building now, which that work was undertaken by SIB, although we have to finish those and we also have to finish tying in the new joists into the external wall to lens the building. When a lot of the materials were removed, there was significant dry and wet rot that was discovered in the building, which hadn't been identified in the original surveys. And again, some of that has been on an emergency basis undertaken by SIB, 
The remainder of that will have to be undertaken by ourselves. Um, the ceiling joists that were in the clock tower building subsequently determined um, were very rotten and had to be removed by SIB and um, those that were there. So now we are having to redo all the ceiling joists along the second floor for the entire of the clock tower building. Now, I would say that in the captain's building, which is the smaller building, um, the state of that building, bar the, the gable, which had to be demolished and rebuilt, were actually in a better state of repairs. And we are retaining the single glazed windows within the captain's house because one, they are a better quality and a better fit. And two, because those are um, cafe and bar areas that we don't believe that the single or the secondary glazing will be required because we don't have people sleeping and living in those areas. But Councillor Dobbins, you are right. Um, we should have picked up these items at the time. And perhaps in hindsight, with a more invasive survey and being a little bit more destructive in the walls and around the windows, uh, in the joists and on some of the structural work, we perhaps could have discovered that, but we didn't. And I can only apologize for that. Thanks. Thank you. Hi. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Dobbins. Um, Councillor McKinney. Thank you, Chair, for letting me in. Uh, I think most of what I was going to say has been covered anyhow. Uh, uh, really, it's along the lines of what uh, Councillor Jackson said. You know, many years ago, there was PVC uh, windows installed there for heat and also to save fuel. And then we had to take them out for the City of Culture. Uh, Maybe HED can tell us um, why we can't fit double glazed sash windows back in uh, of similar design, what was already there, or have I got it wrong? Is that a question for HED then? It's a question really that I'm wondering, has Harry and Cecil put to HED and maybe HED can come in on this? Well, I, not, not at this point. Councillor McKinney, but they are here, and I will afford that opportunity for that question to be asked when we bring HED in. I have I have intentions to to allow for those sorts of questions, but you don't have a question specifically for for Harry and Cecil at this point, no. Just to ask them if they approach HED with that in mind. That was all. Oh ah, yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Hi. Um. Yes, uh, to a certain extent, we did, but we are also aware that, that HED's role um, isn't to take decisions on balance. HED's primary role is the protection of the built environment. And it's something that they take very seriously, having dealt with them over the years, and they are tenacious in that. And it's their job to seek excellence. It's their job to put forward the best possible design for the buildings, the best possible solutions for the buildings. We bring to that a little bit of, of commercial reality. And ultimately, it's for planning and for councillors to take a balanced decision based on the two arguments that sometimes come about. And it's a decision on balance that we're asking councillors to make. I don't believe, and I, I, I won't put um, words in Dermot's mouth, that um, HED, um, no doubt in their mind that what, what they say and what they believe um, is exactly that they should be replaced by single glazed timber putty um, windows. And in the same way that we will have to um, lime render the entire building, which is an increased cost because obviously lime render is much more expensive than a normal sand cement. And that is something which we will do and are committed to do. Because again, it's in the best interest of the building. It allows the walls to breathe. So we're not asking to take away a lot of what was talked about, but ultimately, HED really have little flexibility, and, and that's my belief, um, that they will always seek to maximize um, the, to go best practice in relation to the preservation of our built heritage, and that's their job, and I don't deny that. Um, what comes about then are planners' decisions, and like every, uh, and councillors' decisions and commercial decisions that have to be taken on balance, and it's not HED's decision to do that, it's councillors and planners. Um, our frustration sometimes perhaps is that the HED recommendations are taken as if that they are the final and only say so. When in actual fact, 
the final say so is is councillors and that's why we're here today thank you hi any other questions for the agent and applicant members before i move on councillor mooney thank you chair uh, just a question for harry um just um are you satisfied, Harry, that the, that the replacements that you find um, will, will integrate to the best, uh, you know, for the character of that of that existing building and uh, and the actual and the actual replacements that you're seeking to uh, make in the building? That's that chair, really. Mm -hmm. okay, yes. Right. Um, I tackle that. Yeah, and, and I honestly can say yes, I do. What we're talking about are. Um, sliding sash PVC windows that are in white. Now I accept somebody close up looking at them would probably tell the difference that they're not um, they're not timber. Would they be able to tell the difference that they're not timber um, single glazed rather than double glazed? I think if you're interested in that type of thing, then you will because the, se the section of the mullion um, will be slightly larger for the PVC than it would be for timber because it only has to hold uh, a single piece of glass, which is very light. Whereas the double glazing, as you all know, is heavier. Do I think if you're more than 30 or 40 yards away from it or viewing it from across the river or from the edge of the square? Um, no, I, I don't believe anyone will tell the difference. Um, and I think that's partly because of the nature of the building. It is very symmetrical and the windows form a, quite a small part of the overall elevation. Um, the clock tower obviously is, is, is a significant part. And the windows then are very regular, but they're quite a small opening area compared to the overall development. The windows to the rear, which are inward facing in the courtyard of the hotel, will not be seen by the general public. They'll actually only be seen by the residents of the hotel. So again, I don't think that makes um, a material uh, contribution or a material impact on the view. So really, um, I think the issues that we're talking about are the windows to the front, and I do believe that overall it will make um, a material, it won't make a material impact in people's general perception of the building. Thank you. I've been off that, Councillor. I've been off, Chair. Welcome to the answer. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mooney. Anybody else, any other questions for the applicant or agent? There's nobody in the chamber here, anyway. Anybody online? Don't see anybody indicated, then we will move forward. Uh, members, Thank you. Uh, thanks. All right. Thanks, Cecil. Um, I'm going to move on now. Obviously, we do have uh, Dermot Madden from HED here. Have anybody like to put any questions to Dermot uh, uh, initially? Councillor McKinney, do you want to readdress that to the HED representative? Anyone? I'm happy just to leave it. Thank you, uh, Councillor McKinney. Well, look, in the absence of other, go, go ahead, Councillor Jackson. Thanks, and I suppose, first and foremost, I want to welcome a representative from HED to the committee. I know it's, there, there's been issues with HED in the past um, where council, uh, as members of the committee, we had um, expressed their frustrations at some of the, the findings and the recommendations coming from HED around the historic fabric of our city. And, and um, I suppose, helping to um, maintain and, and preserve some of the buildings. Um, and in many cases, the, the, the recommendations from HED had been, had been quite restrictive um, in terms of the preservation. I suppose, and so it's great that HED have, have a representative from HED has come to committee today um, and I suppose we would just like to ask a question around the engagement um, that HED have had with the applicant, and as and 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 I suppose some rationale for the insistence of a, a single um, a single glazed bundle on on a very prominent location um, and, and within our city centre. We, we just want, we wouldn't mind to hear around the necessity of, of that particular um, 
that particular condition. And and then further to that, um, I suppose to ask in HED, is there any consideration given to the fact that there was previously PVC windows installed on, on that particular building? Um, so I, I, I just wouldn't mind that they, they hear some of the thought process of the officials within HED in coming to their, their determination on this one. So thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Jackson. I was quite curious myself about some of those questions, so I'm glad you asked them. Saves me having to do it. Um, um, Dermot, again, um, thanks, for, thanks for joining us this afternoon. It is, of course, uh, great to have a representative from HED uh, to explain some of the rationale behind uh, the decisions that you do make, particularly in relation uh, to this particular application. Um, so, again, thanks for joining us, Dermot, and if you'd like to um, answer some of the points uh, put to you there by uh, Councillor Jackson. Yes, uh, hello everybody. Thank you for actually being invited along. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, loud and clear. There's a lot in that one question there, so uh, forgive me uh, if I have to, if I miss bits out, feel free to enter, uh, come back. The first point about the building being listed with uh, double glazing in it, that is acknowledged at the time of listing. Uh, double glazing or PVC windows in a building do, do not determine whether a building should remain listed or not, but it is acknowledged within the building that they were inappropriate. Uh, and as has been highlighted, whenever the opportunity came through the city of culture, more appropriate windows were put in, in terms of timber sliding size that would have been on the building at the time of its construction and in character with that. The application put forward it, and Harry is right, and I like to, I think it's a backhanded compliment. Maybe Harry give HED there and, and the diligence of HED, but uh, the comment about the, the application being put forward about putting in PVC windows. Government has spent money putting in timber windows in that. They're only approximately 10 years old. No evidence during the application or any engagement before the application came in about the windows being ill fitting. So the question put forward on the application is, can if I, we put in PVC windows? That was, so it's a, our position is that they're an inappropriate material in terms of the skill set that's required in making a sliding sash window and then through. So in that regard, this is where the timber window is, is seen as being appropriate. I, I did find it slightly curious that Harry mentioned uh, that no, within the current budget, no money was set aside for secondary glazing. Within the original scheme, before it became known that these windows were ill-fitting, which is a separate conversation, it was known that the, that building had single glazed side and side windows on it. Uh, and within the regulations and everything else, the, uh, which was provided during the consultation from HED, significant evidence provided about the benefits of secondary glazing surpassing double glazing units. Uh, so the fact that the hotel use of that clock tower building hasn't changed from the 2017 application, i.e. hotel bedroom accommodation to the new scheme. So I did find that comment slightly curious that segregation hadn't been allowed for, uh, which has now been cited as uh, additional cost. The uh, issue of funding, HED is totally sympathetic to the parameters of now which everybody within the construction sector and wider communities are impacted with uh, funding costs. And HED, as people in the chamber will know, are able, we're one of the few people, in fact, I think we're the only government body that can provide funding to a private individual for repaired historic fabric. That includes windows. Now, unfortunately, we acknowledge our budget has been significantly reduced since 2016, but we are able to assist in repair of historic windows. If an application had been submitted, the application unfortunately has been opened and is now closed for this financial year, but no application has come in from the applicant or the agents, even looking to see if we could assist uh, the evidence these ones that are now ill fitting. Uh, and could we provide some assistance to repair some of these windows? The, uh, say the, 
I kind of, uh, I'm not too sure if I've covered all the topics there, just what was being mentioned uh, across the comments. But the one thing as well, the agent and the applicant talked about, you know, additional structural works being carried out. Again, just like to, point, to my understanding, the significant structural repairs were all carried out by SEB government money. Uh, to assist in repair this building and get it to a position where on the overall round that it's ready for the applicant to start going in within their budget terms, the unforeseen were kind of, uh, but I, I'm not part of SAB, I'm not part of those conversations, but that was my understanding. I'm happy to be correct on that. So HED's position, the simple question has been, can PVC windows go back into this building? When actually what they're doing is taking out windows which government put in, make the building correct, which were timber or more appropriate. Thank you, Dermot. Thanks for that answer. Okay, that, yeah. Anybody else? Any other questions? Anybody in the chat box? No. Um, Dermot, I've got one question uh, of my own for you. Um, I have two, but you've answered one of them because Councillor Jackson asked it. But this one, um, when was the building actually listed? Uh, with the UPVC windows in it, what year? I think the the listing. Now, I would have to check to be honest with you, Chair. But it they were listed the uh, early two thousands or before the city of culture came in uh, with the PVC windows. But that was at the time, obviously, the where we were able to get into the site. The army had left. And the army themselves had carried out significant repairs and, and alterations to the buildings uh, during that time. If you want to give me a, a few seconds, I can give you the exact date I could call up here in the system. When I go time. ahead. I I I bear I bear with you on, on, in relation to that. But if I think I heard you correct, you said then that they were listed just before. Um. I, I think our head of planning may well know. Uh, might save us a bit of time. Go ahead, Mark. Yeah, I was working on that at the time. Um, and I recall the city of culture, it would have been at least in and around two or three years before that, the discussions and negotiations about what was listed, what would be demolished and what would be retained as non-listed on the site. Um, so it was a good few years, even I would say 2010, 2011, maybe, but I mean, you I've might just, have the exact. I've just called it up there. It was the 29th of December, 2006. There you are. Uh, even our head of planning is quite surprised uh, to, hear, to hear that. So 2006, uh, but they obviously were uh, listed with UPVC windows in them. I can't understand how it would have been, but that's kind of why I asked the question. And I would imagine uh, that those UPVC windows uh, that were listed along with the building were installed by the uh, MOD um, yeah. because they were used as living, living accommodation um, for uh, members of the military at that particular time. Uh, and so it would have been considered perhaps by them, uh, Dermot, that uh, it was important uh, enough for them to uh, keep the people who work for them nice and warm and cosy. Uh, I would say that was part of it, but I also remember, uh, Chair, that those windows, we don't know when exactly they were put in, but looking at the age, you know, historic evidence and the records of those windows were probably put in late nine, early 90s, if not the late 80s, where the climate uh, of the Everton Barracks and needs for security and the protection those type of windows were provided as opposed to a timber uh, historic window would have provided would have, I would say also been a, a mitigating factor of what was carried out. All right, thanks for that question answered. Um, Dermot, um, a couple more people have now indicated to me as well. So Councillor Logue. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, Dermot, you have already um, answered my the question that I had, and it was regarding the, the lotson of the building. And, you know, uh, was it listed with the PVC windows? And then you have confirmed uh, that it was. But I suppose it's not so much a question now, but just an observation. And given what we have heard about the, the quality uh, and I suppose the usefulness of the the, the windows, the sash windows that replaced the, the PVC 
uh, windows, and I suppose mainly too because government money was used, not government, <laughs> people's money was used to uh, to, re to restore the, these windows. That the the quality of the work seems somewhat shoddy, and you know um, that to me was certainly uh, not acceptable. Thanks, Councillor Logan. I don't think there was a question really there, but more an observation. Uh, thanks, Patricia. Uh, Councillor Jackson. Thanks. Thanks, Chair. And I, I suppose it's just picking up on a point that you, you alluded to yourself. Um, I suppose, from a HED perspective, is there any consideration or is there any wit um, afforded the, the change in circumstances? Now, I, I think you referred to yourself, Chair, that um, that the Ebrington site um, once was a lot different to what it is now. Um, and our our ambitions for the Ebrington site is is they they, they very much um, make it accessible, they make it um, open and they incorporate it as a large part of our city centre. Um, and Given given that the the prominent location, um, the huge increase in footfall, the the, the huge um, increase in accessibility of the site um, compared to its previous use, there there's I, I'm just I'm just querying around what levels of leeway um, there there are, there are what considerations do HED. Um, give to I suppose progression um, because the, the the entire Ebrington site is is completely unrecognisable to what it was um, only 15, 20 years ago. So if uh, as we progress as a city, um, we we would hope that a lot of the historic buildings that are contained within our city are promoted the modernize and you we would we, we wouldn't let, like to be in a position where um where we're, we're having a constant battle with HED um they they, they sort of they, they allow our city to progress or in particular our city center so I'm just I, I would just be curious to, to see what is there any thinking within HED they take into consideration the change in nature of of the environment that the building is set on. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Councillor Jackson. Again, Dermot, a um, uh, yeah. couple of questions there for you to answer. Yeah, thank you again, Chair. In the wider prospect, I would say that HED has been uh, within the city, you know, I can't honestly think of a building that HED hasn't, in terms of a listed building, hasn't precluded any development but uh, around the city and um, Ebrington Barracks is a show of that the quality of architecture is coming in within this hotel the quality of the architecture is coming in within the maritime museum and other elements that are being discussed alone I would hope that council would acknowledge HED is very willing to engage and uh, you know allow buildings to be adapted and altered however there is a requirement to ensure that historic fabric where it remains is protected. That is the bit where the quality of the skills of our previous generations are retained and inherently built into. So in the in the wider context of that, you, you know, uh, I give an example of Clarendon Street in Derry City. You walk up that, that's a terrace row of brick, Edwardian and it's sliding sash windows. Go one street across into uh, Asylum Street and walk up that. Look at the impact the change of the windows have to that street. Two streets that look exactly the same in terms of the character of buildings. So HTD's role, while it may seem as being restrictive in terms of what is being retained in its character, add to the wider character of the area. And we feel we're doing that within Everington Barracks while allowing things to move on. If the question then is into energy efficiency, which is a slightly different question and a slightly different intake, which has been impl implemented here or implied here within this application. Within the building regulations themselves, particularly books F2, which are energy uh, do with energy efficiency, they themselves acknowledge that 
they talk about protected buildings and buildings of historic or, archi or architectural interest, which includes listed buildings, or why it's not ideal or exempt from the requirements to an extent, to a lesser extent, to an extent, to ensure that the protection of their character, i.e., their historic fabric, is protected and can be offset by other means. A uh, prime example being additional, uh, you know, changing the heating system, the installation of a secondary glazing window system, increase of insulation into roof spaces. So the policies are already there uh, in terms of that. Everington Barracks as a general whole, uh, because of the work that the, the Army themselves did to, the, to work on the conditions they run whenever we got in to assess this historic site, you know, and its importance to the history and the, and the story of Derry City, the city side and the water side. All we had really essentially had left was key fabric pieces of element, window openings, apertures, some historic windows, uh, and the overall massing and, and development within that site. Uh, there's a significant amount of alterations being carried out in terms of the design within the internal floor plates, elements of building being added. So we would say we've been very uh, accommodating, but within our realm to make sure that actually the reason that the applicant went to Ebrington was a historic site to get a hotel on it, to then start to just slowly remove the bits that we've tried to maintain uh, it's the death by a thousand cuts and it has a significant impact in what this council I would feel would say if if this PVC bundle is allowed into the into these buildings because the work and the effort that normal homeowners go to maintaining their historic windows and looking after historic fabric um, is potentially looked upon as being set aside, I think sets it down a dangerous thing. Hedgy, you're always willing and open to conversation. Uh, this application, I say, was the first time we were aware that the existing windows in the clock tower building were no longer fit for purpose. But no conversation happened around that an application came in to put in PVC windows. Thanks, Dermot. Okay. Um... <coughs> It's funny you actually mentioned Clarendon Street there and the, the area there. Dermot, I was actually born and raised in that neighbourhood and I remember my own father having these very um, same um, conversations with HED of the time, shall we say, um, around single glazed sash windows. And I can tell you from personal experience, the winter did feel very cold with those types of windows. Anyway, we'll move on. Councillor Dobbins. Yeah, thank you, Chairman and Keepy. Um... Uh, just Dermot, uh, you, you finished off there saying um, you're always willing and open, um, but that no conversation w was or no, no um, approach to HTD was made. Um, surely there was um, with regard to this. And I, I, I for one, I do realise that the list of discrepancies and uncosted inadequacies from the applicant and from the, the consultant involved with this. Now, that's their fault, but they are looking to rectify. And as you had rightly said, we 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 are progressing on. We are now in 2022. So therefore, you know, wooden windows and sashes um, may not be uh, fit for purpose for, for this building but surely HED would perhaps um, consider you know instead of like for like but like for lookalike and if there was maybe something you know in a PVC form but actually did look like um, a wooden window and I know they're available um, you know would would HED be favourable of, of that rather than than the wooden than the wooden wooden sash windows, you know, I just think there can be compromise here, and I totally totally agree with you that um we need to protect uh whilst, whilst we are a city that is progressing, um I acknowledge that there's a lot of historic fabric, um uh, historic buildings with historic fabric that that need to be retained, 
But um, I, I do, on the other hand, uh, realize that we are moving on. We are becoming more modernistic. Um, Why things look should remain looking the same, that maybe the materials is, um, is different. So what would HED, uh, the view on that be? W would you be sympathetic to the mere fact that wooden sash windows to fit a single use is not fit for purpose for this building? Go ahead. Thanks, Councillor Dobbins. Go ahead, Dermot. Uh, thanks, Councillor Dobbins. I suppose the short answer is no. The, the rest of the site has timber. Uh, site. These windows are, are being said they're no longer fit because they do not fit. Uh, there's, uh, as I said, you know, the, there's umpteen buildings around that Ebrington site that have sliding sash windows in it uh, that, and the buildings are occupied and there's no issue uh, in terms of they can be sealed better, they can be insulated better, wind proof, uh, draft proof better. And as, and as I say, from the point of view of the energy efficiency aspect of it, the evidence which again was provided through this application process to the agent shows that secondary glazing uh, in, is a far better option, more cost effective option in both sound and in the uh, heat transfer. The materiality is uh, an issue in terms of, it's not only about you know protecting the, the historic fabric in terms of material, but it's also protecting the skill sets uh, that manufacture these uh, joinery items uh, and not becoming factory fitted, uh, you know, uh, PVC. This was, I think, hardly acknowledged. I, I, I do not uh, argue, as Harry said, you know, that the, the PVC bundle of which they have picked is probably the best replica looky lakey slide size bundle that can be obtained. However, there are subtle differences, uh, and, and as the subtle differences with HED are employed and are assigned to look after to make sure that you. Know, the sort of, in terms of the depth of the timber, the quality of the timber, the actual the makeup, the connection joinery pieces of that. Uh, the question we've been asked in this application is very, you know, is PVC window was appropriate? Oh, and we're saying they're not, but I'm not aware of any conversation that, you know, around these windows before the application came in. Uh, there was, I, I sat on that Ebrington site, uh, what used to be daily, COVID has changed that, but weekly. Um, Nobody knocked my door and said there's a problem with these windows um, in terms of they don't fit. Now, uh, and it never definitely never expanded to what's uh, available outside of uh, the application that I, that I can recall. Are you doubt? I don't see any other questions for you here. Mr. Chairman, would it be possible for me just to respond to one or two points? Sorry, I'm, I'm terribly sorry, but um, the protocol wouldn't allow me uh, to permit that um, at this particular juncture. Um, I'm, terribly, I'm, I'm, afraid, I'm afraid I can't allow you to do that. If I allow you, I have to allow everybody else that ever asks me in the future. So we're going to stick to the protocol if you don't mind. Um, uh, so, um, uh, Members, are there any other questions? Bear with me a second. Just want to think about something here. I'm sorry about that. The the protocol means that the the um, applicant can speak first and the objector speaks second. And when I allow the objector to speak second, uh, then clearly I'm uh, not permitted then to go back to the applicant. Um, I did make the rules. Those rules are set and handed down to us by the department, indeed. Um, and so HED are an objector, uh, and they have spoken. So if there is no other questions for HED members, uh, I am going to uh, pass it over now for questions to uh, the officer, Malagi. If anybody has any questions for Malagi, please indicate. Andre, do you have a question for Malaga? Okay, Andre would like to speak. Okay.
All right, I thought Andre was going to say something to us there, but Andre will also take questions. Sorry, it was my mistake, Malika. You didn't present that report. We've been sitting here that long. I can't. I, my head's going round. Okay. Any questions for Andre? Terribly sorry. Sorry, Andre. My apologies. I don't think there was any questions for Malika. Um, that's probably why you didn't have any. Um, are there any questions for Andre? I'm assuming not. Okay. Um, uh, okay, members. So there aren't any questions for um, the officer. Members, there's a recommendation in front of us here this afternoon, um, and the recommendation is to refuse uh, this particular application, uh, and I'm putting it open to the floor. Uh, okay, there's a there's a there's a, a there's a recommendation on the floor. The recommendation to is, is to refuse. Um, if you're so minded to refuse this, then I will need a proposer and a seconder. And if you're not, then I'll also need a proposer and a seconder for that. And we obviously can't sit here all day. So, uh, okay, members, anybody wish to speak? Uh, now that we're moving to the decision, anybody, Councillor Mooney. <laughs> Chair, thank you. Um, I've listened intently for the last while about on this discussion, and um, and I thank all contributors to it. But at this point, I don't think I'm content with the officer's recommendation, and I would seek to overturn it. I think, on the basis in my mind, that the discussions I have heard is that one of the most salient reasons that I have heard is that there's been a change of use on this site. That there, there, in my mind, that would sort of demonstrate there's been a precedent set already. The number, namely, they were um, EPVC windows. They were changed then for the city of culture, presumably for some um, commercial or aesthetic reason that there was used as a gallery. Um, now we've heard that uh, the developer wishes to um, change the conditions that were initially set by the committee in 2017, uh, demonstrably for commercial reasons, but more so to keep this project on track. As my colleagues have said, that uh, it is a very important um, site. It's a very important um, generator for the Ebden site, this hotel development. Um, I've heard the applicant and I've heard uh, the applicant's agents say that uh, demonstrably that that you would probably you would need to go up to the windows and look at uh, them intently uh, in regards to the replacement models. That gives me. And that satisfies me that the replacements that they're going to bring on to the site are um, worthy of the purpose. So in light of that, and in light of hearing from um, the HED representative, I do think that this is a, a situation where we can um, satisfactorily overturn the recommendation based on the fact that a precedent has been set and that the replacement uh, models are satisfactory, and also the fact that uh, it will keep um, this venture uh, on track, which is um, which has been in train for a long time in this site, and I'm sure myself and the, hopefully the committee would put feel the same that this venture should stay on track as well. So on that basis, um, Chair, I would uh, put forward that recommendation, the proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mooney. Anybody else, Councillor Jackson? Um, thanks. Chair, and I'm content to, to second the proposal that's been made um, with the reasons given. Um, but that, that's no reason. That, and, and I think HED, um, the representative from HED, alluded to it himself um, around the selection of this site for the hotel was was exactly because of the historic um, value of the site and. And every every effort that, that we've seen as a committee, or certainly I've seen as a member of the committee, has been to retain and respect that historic fabric. And this is this is another um, step in that direction. Um, I, I don't accept the findings that that this is going to have a demonstrable impact um, to the buildings or the wider um, Everton Square. As a whole, so um, I'm content to 
to see progression at the site um, and content the, the second the proposal as a step towards that progression. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Jackson. Um, are there any other members that want to say anything before we move forward to a vote on that particular proposal? Um, thank you. Uh, noted uh, Councillor Gallagher was not here for the full debate, unfortunately, and won't be on. He'll have to uh, abstain. Thanks for that, Councillor Gallagher. Um, just from my own perspective, uh, clearly, um, uh, as, uh, as another member of the committee who's going to vote on this, you know, I I share the view of the representation from um, Mark Durgan, MLA, and my view, uh, the multiple benefits of this project will far outweigh and exceed um, uh, on this particular occasion. However, I think it's important for us to also appreciate and realise uh, and, and put forward a message as well is that this doesn't mean that we're in favour of a free-for-all for, -all for um, uh, those who may well have other projects um, uh, uh, that HED may well object to. HED may well in the future have very, very good reason to object to other applications. So so that's just a few of my own thoughts on it. Can I also thank um, uh, Harry, Cecil and Dermot uh, for coming uh, today. And we've obviously taken some considerable time on this. I'm sure you're, you obviously you've been witness to that. However, we do now have uh, a recommend, uh, or, um, a proposal on the floor from Councillor Mooney, um, uh, seconded by Councillor Jackson, and that actually is uh, to overturn officer recommendation to refuse. So members, I'm going to pass it over to Maura, and Maura is going to take us through the vote. Thank you, Chair. This is item three, members, um, and it's a recommendation to overturn the, uh, sorry, it's a vote in order to uh, consider the overturn of the officer's recommendation. Alderman Alan Breslin. For. Alderman Keith Kerrigan. Alderman Drew Thompson, apologies. Councillor Jason Barr. Or more. Thanks. Councillor Raymond Barr, apologies. Councillor John Boyle. Or. Councillor Angela Dobbins. Or Mora. Thanks. Councillor Paul Gallagher. Stained. Yeah. Councillor Christopher Jackson. Or more. Thank you. Councillor Dan Kelly. Or more. Thanks. Councillor Patricia Logue. Thanks. Councillor Kieran Maguire. Oh, he's not coming here. Apologies. Councillor Philip McKinney. Or. And Councillor Sean Mooney. Or. So that's just one abstention, Chair, and the rest. Okay, members, I think you can work that out. Uh, so all uh, who voted are uh, for. Uh, and, uh, Councillor Gallagher's abstention is noted uh, for the technical reason that he wasn't here for the full debate. Um, members, that obviously will uh, progress forward from here. Are there any further thoughts on that, or is that is that all done with it? No, no sorry, the second item relates to the listed both consent, so that application I was needs to be dealt thing. with. Yeah. I think I had to go up the road for somebody to consider. Well, right, members. Sorry, that's when we deal with the LBC. We will have to deal with that because right. notification procedures. Yeah, getting ahead of myself, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yes. Terribly sorry. <laughs> okay, members. Look. Um, uh, we normally would go for a break at the two hour mark. We're well past past that. I know the next application is in relation to this one, but I think everybody um, probably needs 10 minutes of, of a break at this point. I know why I do. Thank you.
Thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks for hanging on for that uh, comfort break there. So, members, the next application is application number four, uh, obviously relating to the previous application as well. Uh, LA 11 2022 0387 LBC. And, Andre, if you want to run uh, through that for us. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, item 4 is LA 11 2022 LBC and the proposal is a Section 95 application to remove Conditions 3 and 4 of Application LA 11 2017 0856 LBC requiring timber single glazed windows to permit UV UPVC sliding slash double glazed windows um, and it's located at the Ebrington Barrack sites, building 6379 and 67-69, uh, the Clock Tower building, and the recommendation is to refuse. So, members, this is the site location shown on the site location plan just um, on the slide here. And this is just an aerial view of the site with the application site outlined in red and the buildings, the main building, the Plot Tower building from Sunday, Ebrington Square. Well, well, Commissioner Logue, uh, this will probably be a much more abridged version of what we went through with, with the last one. So I have encouraged officers to bear that in mind um, uh, as well. Okay, carry on, Andre. So this is just photo montages of the approved hotel building on the site. Um, this is the existing building numbers, um, and the approved additions are shown in grey there for the approved um, hotel development. That is just an elevation of the clock tower building and the gable elevation. So um, because this is in relation to listed building consent, um, during the processing of the application, the Council uh, consulted with Historic Buildings and they advised that um, the proposal as presented shall have a significant adverse impact on the listed buildings and three reasons for refusal have been provided. Um, there was no representations received, but there was um, a member's laid out impact at the, a letter of support from Mark Durkin, MLA. So the policy consideration um, includes the dairy area plan, the SPPS and PPS6. Um, the proposal is considered unacceptable and that it would have a significant adverse impact on the list of buildings and is contrary to the SPPS in, uh, in particular paragraphs S, sorry, 6.12 and 6.13 um, and the PPS6 policy BH8 and BH11. And Refusal is recommended for the reasons set out on the slide. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. Um, for that, I quit, uh, sorry, we do, of course, still have, I think, um, Harry and Cecil online. Uh, gentlemen, if there is anything further that you feel you want to add, I'll give you the opportunity to do so. Um, uh, and if you do, of course, I could would also like to encourage you to keep it. Um, relatively brief. So, go ahead. Chair, I, I have nothing further to add um, to what we previously discussed, if that's okay. But I'm available for questions. Okay. Um, I don't sense that there's any questions for yourself either in relation to this one. Don't see anybody indicating here. Um, and uh, I think, Cecil, are you content to move on? Absolutely, I'd like to thank the committee uh, for for your work today. So yeah, we're happy to move on. Thank you. Okay, members, I think again, uh, Dermot uh, is also still with us. Dermot, uh, again, I have to afford you as the representative of the objector, objector, an opportunity. If there's anything you feel that you want to add to this, thank you, Chair. No. no uh, no point in reiterating the conversation we've already had. So, but I'm oh, happy to take questions if they're there. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks, Dermot, and thank thank you again to you, um, to Harry and Cecil, uh, and finally, uh, uh, members. Any further questions for Andre? 
Are there questions for Andre either? Okay, members, so again, in relation to this, it's a recommendation for refusal. Um, but before we move to that, I've just had an indication the head of planning would like to address you. So go ahead, Mara. It's just in terms of one of the questions you had earlier, and we, we, we sort of moved on from it before the break. Um, there's two, two things, just members, it's just important for me to highlight that this balance and judgment, which we obviously and officers have highlighted in the report, um, that we've taken on board, you know, any planning issues that we feel that we could have in terms of waiting and giving advice and recommendation that this particular building and its location and its status as a listed building, that, you know, that was why we have um, considered the weight of the consultee in this instance, and we've gone in that, uh, taken that position. Um, so it's just important for me to highlight that in terms of the, the listed building consent. And also I think, Andre, we have also to remind or let members know that the notification um, procedures are relevant in regards to listed buildings for DFI. Um, Andre, if you want to just go over the detail of that, thanks. Um, yes, thank you. Um, through the chair, just um, with regards specifically to listed building consent, um, councils are required to notify DFI when they intend to grant uh, listed building consent against the advice of the statutory consultee, um, which in this case is Historic Environment Division, um, and that's under Section 89 of the Planning Act. So we will have to notify DFI in the event that members wish to overturn the recommendation to refuse and approve or consent the application. Thank you. Thank you, Maura. Thank you, Andre. Uh, Mr. Log. Can I just ask, can a letter be sent from this council, maybe in your name, Chair, as to the reasons why council uh, have not taken this advice? Can that accompany that notification? Yeah, that's that's a requirement that we we you will we have when we give the letter. Previously, we discussed this earlier, just about the actual formal letter that goes to DFI with accompanying information. That clearly indicates um, the report, but also gives an insight into members. You know, position we really give the position of members and the actual um reasons behind the notification and, and raise the criteria as well but the background and the context around the decision making are all part of that so that's fine ground well i suppose it's just previously agreed we could get a copy before it goes thank you yes no problem of course thank you thank you Councillor Oak. thank you Maura. um okay members so there it is. It's on the, the floor currently as a refusal. And I'll put it up to yourselves again. Mr. Mooney. Yes, Chair. Um, mission item four. Um, my proposal will be to overturn the officer's recommendation as per my reasons that I gave in item three. It's a like for like similar application. So on that basis, uh, also based on the reasons that I gave in item three. Thank you, Chair. Again, thank you, Councillor Mini. Seconder for that, Councillor Jackson. Yeah, Councillor Jackson. Okay, so we have a proposal on the floor now from Councillor Mini um, to over overturn uh, officer recommendation seconded by uh, Councillor Jackson. Members, I'm of uh, perhaps of a mind that uh, no one will change their vote uh, as they voted last time, albeit. Uh, Councillor Gallagher, I'd offer you the opportunity if you want to consider um, uh, whether you want to vote on this one or not. I'll so abstain. Yeah. You're going to abstain again, Councillor Gallagher. That's okay. That's fine. So uh, uh, unless I see anybody indicating that they're going to change their vote, then we'll record the vote as it was in the last application. Okay. I uh, just note now. I see that. I just note now, actually, that one of our councillors has departed. Do you know, just to be set on the safe side, members, well, let's just record the vote and so then we'll know who's here and who's not. Thank you, Chair. Um, members, this is item four, and it is 
Vote and not accept officer's recommendation and approve the, the LBC, the listed building consent. Alderman Alan Breslin. For. Alderman Keith Kerrigan. Thank you. Um, Councillor Jason Barr. For. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Boyle. For. Uh, Thank you. Councillor Angela Dobbins. For. More. Thank you. Councillor Paul Gallagher. Yeah. Councillor Christopher Jackson. Or Mora. Thank you. Councillor Kelly. Or Mora. Thanks. Councillor Patricia Logue. Thanks. Councillor Kieran McGuire. Oh, apologies. Councillor Philip McKinney. Gone. Councillor Sean Mooney. Or. Thank you. It's the same chair. Okay, uh, members, um, pretty much as it was uh, last time around with the um, uh, departure of just one of the members who voted in the last application. Again, before we move on, uh, thanks to all who um, who contributed here to Harry, to Cecil uh, and to Dermot. And Cecil, I noted as well that you uh, extended an invite for our planning committee to visit uh, the site. Uh, I'm absolutely sure we'd be delighted to come uh, and have a look around and perhaps um, we could organise that uh, between yourselves and, and our planning team to see when that might suit. Uh, I'm fairly sure many of our members would be very interested uh, in how things are progressing. So, uh, Mr. Chair, we will be delighted to facilitate that visit. Just set it up with us so we can do appropriate uh, permissions from the contractor uh, and appropriate gear. But we'll be absolutely delighted to 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 show you all around. And thank you for your decision today. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, um, Cecil. Okay, okay members. Okay. Happy to move on. And our next item is item number six. LA 11 2021 f um, A recommendation for approval. And we have Katrina, who's patiently been sitting here waiting. So go ahead, uh, Katrina. Thank you, Chair. Um, so item six, um, the application is a proposed site for dwelling and garage at 55 metres southwest of 2 Kelly Mallet Road, Cullion, and the recommendation is to refuse. So um, the site is located within a rural area approximately um, uh, three kilometres southeast of Mahra Mason, approximately three and a half kilometres east of Brady. There's a dwelling adjacent to the site to the north at 114 Duncastle Road, a dwelling adjacent to the east at 2 Kelly Mallet Road, and a dwelling opposite the site to the west at 115 Duncastle Road. So here's some photos of the application site. The northern and eastern section of a large, larger agricultural field located at the junction of Duncastle Road and Kelly Mallet Road. Duncastle Road runs parallel to the western boundary of the field and Kelly Mallet Road runs parallel to the southern boundary of the field. Uh, the field sits at a slightly higher level above both roads. The land within the field is gently undulating but generally rises from the Duncastle Road in an easterly direction towards the adjacent property at number two. The northern boundary of the site with 114 Duncastle Road is defined by mature trees and the eastern boundary of the site with 2 Kelly Mallet Road is defined by post and wire fence and the southern and western boundaries of the application site within the field are undefined. So this uh, slide just shows you the policy context as uh, per your report um, that we considered. Um, slide five shows you the plan and history. So uh, site one, as you can see here in red, um, is the current application site. And this also has history that another application was submitted on, but was declined to be determined as it was within two years of the plan and appeal, um, as set out under section 46 of the 2011 Planning Act. Um, the reduction to one dwelling at this stage was not considered a significant or a substantial change to the permission refused previously by the council and the PBC and the PAC. So that is why um, we sent it back. Um, site uh, two uh, was the site for two dwellings that was refused at uh, the committee of the 5th of June 2019 under CTY1, CTY8 and CTY2A. Now site two also incorporated site one. Um, there was a subsequent appeal and all three refusal reasons were sustained and the appeal decision was in February 2020. 
So the objections that were received in this, there was one letter of objection from two Kelly Mallet Road um, about discrepancies in the site address and objectors property omitted from plans. Previous refusal of plan and permission on the site doesn't meet criteria of policy CTY2A. Increase in traffic and impact on road pedestrian safety. Proximity of access to objectors access and to the junction of Doncaster Road and the impacts on the line of sight. Um, development of site will decrease the ability of the field to absorb rainwater and add to flooding on the Doncaster Road, which is hazardous to road users, and uh, a pair of yellow hammer birds nest on the edge of the field. So all objections have been dealt with through um, the, uh, the report. So um, slide seven here shows policy um, CTY2A. So. Um, as per the previous application refused here at committee, um, numbers two, three and five of CTY2A is still um, not being met and this was not met at the appeal either. So um, this shows um, number one, um, which shows the development, which shows that under CTY2A point one is met. Um, Criteria 2 of CTY 2A uh, shows here that the cluster does not appear as a visual entity in the local landscape. Approaching from the north along the Duncastle Road, the dwellings on Kelly Mallet Road are not visible. The dwelling at 114 Duncastle Road reads as a dwelling sitting alone with the site behind this boundary of trees, as you can see in the photograph here. So approaching from the south along the Duncastle Road, the dwellings on Kelly Mallet Road um cannot be seen uh, there is no awareness of a cluster of development now the agent did submit this photograph that book interferes to views of the existing cluster from dullerton road to the west and this is a long distance view from over 0.5 kilometers away it's obviously zoomed up for this picture because i've been out and actually looked at this view and you can't see it like this at all in the landscape so criteria three, um, the cluster is not located at a crossroads or associated with a focal point, such as a social or community building or facility. The applicant has identified a bus stop as a focal point, but planning officials do not consider this merits a focal point. Now, in the previous appeal in this site, the PA C Commissioner determined the small orange hall and the former railway station north of the cluster could not be considered focal points associated with the cluster given their distance from the cluster. So that was used at a previous application stage as focal points. So criteria five, the development of the site would not be rounding off and consolidation of an existing cluster, but would visually intrude into the open countryside and would harm the rural character of the area. The four dwellings to the east of the site at numbers two, four, a six and eight Kelly Mallet Road appear as a ribbon of development and a dwelling on the site would extend this ribbon further west towards Doncastle Road. And this was one of the criteria that was refused at this committee before and the PAC agreed with. So, and criteria six, there's no overlooking loss of light um, and this would result to neighbouring properties subject to inappropriate design because this is only outline stage. So the proposal would satisfy criteria six of CTY2A. So in terms of policy CTY8 and policy CTY14, um, there is a single dwelling to the north of the site at 114 Duncastle Road and no development to the south. Therefore, there is not a line of three buildings along Duncastle Road, but this proposal will create a ribbon of development along the Duncastle Road. So the dwelling to the west at 115 Duncastle Road has frontage onto the road and doesn't read with the dwellings on Kelly Mallet Road. But in the ribbon of development on Kelly Mallet Road stops at two Kelly Mallet Road. So this dwelling would extend this ribbon of development further west and would add to build up and of development in the area. So it would be contrary to policy CTY8 and 14 um, as before the application or as the previous application was as well. So other policy considerations in terms of PPS3, the development proposes a new access onto Kelly Mallet Road and DFI roads have no objections. Concerns were raised um, through an objection in relation to the access agreements, but traffic speed was considered and uh, these are achievable. The visibility displays in the forward sight distance are achievable and the level of traffic generated from a single dwelling would not intensify the existing road network to the point where it would be detrimental to the safety and convenience of the road users. 
In terms of PBS 15, that was also raised um, as an objection about water possibly flooding uh, the Doncastle Road. Um, so. Uh, DFI Rivers were consulted at the time of the previous application and DFI Rivers advised its applicant's responsibility to assess flood risk and drainage impact and to mitigate risk to the development. A drainage assessment was not required um, due to the size of the site and it was considered that the development would not exacerbate any surface water flooding at this location. So PPS 15 was met. In terms of PPS2, Natural Heritage, a section of hedge and five trees require removal to provide the new access. The roadside hedge is not continuous and would not be considered NI priority habitat. Um, the five hawthorn trees are young trees, not considered likely to harbour bat roost features. So removal of hedge and trees can be done outside the bird breeding season. Um, the PEA um, submitted proposes new tree planting behind the visibility sleighs to compensate for the loss of existing vegetation. Um, the objector had raised uh, concerns about the yellow hammer birds, um, but these are not a priority species protected by law. This was also brought up at um, the plan and appeal and the commissioner considered it and also came to that conclusion that it would not have a significant detrimental impact on this species. Um, the development shall not adversely impact uh, prior protected or priority species. So it's in accordance with policies NH3 and NH5, and it doesn't have any hydrological links to any designated site. So it complies with NH1 and NH3. So that's just some photographs there of, to give you an idea of the vegetation along the roadside. So there was a late item um, submitted by the agent that you have um, received in your packs. So I'll just go um, through the, the points that were raised. So um, the first point was that it said that in 1840s, Griffith valuation map um, identified Cullion. Um, so we, we, we would say that this is a townland. And he's also mentioned at point three or at um, point two there, the council have now erected two signposts at the cluster identifying the areas. Colin, now when I went out, I went out yesterday actually um, to have a look again at the area. Now, and every single townland in the district now they have put up signs with different things. So literally one one road over. Um, the townland then says Altrest and two roads over it says Tamna Bryan. So, uh, you know, it's just townlands. I don't think it's identified as a separate cluster. Um, in terms of the third point, um, it identifies public vantage points on Kelly Mallet Road and Dollerton Road, where the cluster appears as a visual entity in the landscape. Um, so this is the map that um, the agent had submitted showing the view as you're coming along the Kelly Mallet Road. And he had said that we hadn't considered this viewpoint. Now the case officer had considered it, but just because we were coming to committee with the presentation, I went out yesterday again. And you can kind of see from that photograph, it's taken quite high up, but this was my photograph of the exact same site taken standing in the middle of the road from the same point. So I'll just show you a side by side comparison here so that you can get an idea that you can't see it as a cluster and we have assessed that. So um, uh, he also identifies a bus stop as a public meeting uh, point and focal point, and we don't consider this a focal point. Uh, Catenza site has a strong visual linkage with adjacent plots and would consolidate the character. Obviously, there are a few reasons we've put forward. We wouldn't agree with that. Uh, Catenza development would not intrude into the countryside or alter the character of the areas or development around the site. The same, we would have refusal reasons that would be contrary to that. And the plan and authority's approach to clustering is at odds with the PAC and he's listed a number of appeals, which found that not meeting the policy in its entirety was not fatal, but recognised the overall thrust of the policy was to consolidate development. Well, as you're probably aware, um, and it was circulated um, by Suzanne as a late item, there was an appeal on this site. Um, now, the appeal that was circulated by the agent um, was dated uh, the 6th of June uh, 2018 and the Commissioner was Helen Fitzsimons um, and she fully assessed CTY2A and the appeal that we had on this site was on the 10th of February 2020 by the same Commissioner and she fully assessed CTY2A. So I, I, I would say that 
you know, our decision on this site is more up to date. And um, I, I would say that our, our approach is not at odds at all. So, in summary, uh, the proposal is contrary to policy CTY1. The proposal fails to meet uh, three of the criteria of policy CTY 2A, which permits new dwellings and existing clusters. The proposal is not considered to be a small gap outlined as an exception to policy CTY8. The proposal would create and add to a ribbon of development contrary to policy CTY8 and CTY14. And the proposal would add to a suburban style buildup of development contrary to policy CTY14. These are the, uh, the same refusal reasons as we had on the application that previously came before committee and was assessed at appeal. So, um, and these are the refusal reasons that we're putting forward today. Thank you. Thank you, Katrina. Apologies for confusing the two applications. I was looking at the one in front, which had your name and uh, open lights uh, uh, as well. Um, however, this is LA 11 2022 0384 forward slash O. So we have uh, online. Here, uh, Chris Cassidy, the agent uh, for this application. Uh, and so, Chris, you're very welcome. Uh, thanks for joining us again this afternoon. And again, thanks for your patience for hanging on. Um, so I'm going to pass it over to you. Thank you. Um, members, thank you for the opportunity to speak in support of this application today. The site, as was outlined there, was previously refused at planning appeal. A planning appeal is based on information your agents admits to support it. Before submitting this application, I studied the appeal decision to see what had been submitted, but more importantly, what wasn't submitted. The appeal was submitted and heard under an info site, which never stood a chance. A cluster seemed to be added at the site visit as an afterthought. It quickly became obvious the applicant got very poor representation. And as a result, the, the site was never fully considered under the cluster policy. In this application, council contend there are two main issues. Firstly, the cluster development. Of the, is there a cluster development at this location? Cullion, as Katrina uh, identified there, is on the 1840s valuation map. It identifies our site as being adjacent to a meeting house. It's now demolished and replaced to a dwelling house. Presently, the council has two road signs erected going into it, identifying it as, as Cullion. As agents, we would contend there are two public vantage points to show the cluster appearing as a visual entity in the local landscape. Neither of these viewpoints had been considered by the planning appeals. Viewpoint one is when approaching from the south along Kilimala Road, a view council or planning appeals hadn't been considered until yesterday. Travelling north along the road turned towards St. Castle Road, there is an awareness of the cluster development with a gripping of at least six houses. Policy only requires three houses for it to be considered a cluster, thus it easily, easily meets this criteria. A second viewpoint is taken from Dullerton Road to the west. Again, the planning appeals did not consider this view. The wording of the policy is the cluster should appear as a visual entity in the landscape. All public vantage points are legitimate views. And from this point, the cluster is clearly evident, with at least 10 houses closely grouped. The second cluster, the second criteria council contend is not met as the cluster is not associated with a focal point. Policy doesn't define what a focal point is, but implies a public meeting point with a visual or phys physical relationship with the site. Previously, various features have been accepted as focal points, including disused churches, graveyards, Cross, crossroads, shops, picnic areas, a tree plantation, uh, a river, listed buildings and fords. Policy does not define how big a focal point must be. In general, it is accepted as being somewhere the public would identify or meet. In this instance, there, there is a bus stop at the junction of Duncastle Road and Kilimala Road. This focal point was not brought into the plan and appeals consideration. The bus stop is of a solid construction with a concrete plinth. It is sitting inside. It is a place where the public would meet or congregate and is known locally as Cullion Bus Stop. It is easily identified and adjacent to our site. Another issue addressed at the Planning Appeals the site does not meet all the criteria as, as to be acceptable. Planning Appeals have been consistent in their approach and that not meeting the cluster policy in its entirety is not fatal. 
There are now numerous appeal decisions where this has been there has been no focal point. The planning appeal recognises that the overall thrust of the policy is to consolidate development and have formed an opinion that if in general it meets the policy, it should be approved. In this case, the site is a strong visual linkage with adjacent plots and will consolidate and round off the cluster. It will not intrude into the, the surrounding countryside as there's development on both sides. I believe members, there's a strong grounds to reconsider this rec recommendation and thank you for your time. Thank you, uh, Chris. Um, for that, members, anybody have any uh, questions for the agent? Alderman Kerrigan. Thank you very much, Chair, for allowing me in. Um, I do take on board some of the points that the, the uh, agent has stated, and uh, I know he does reference Cullion as, as more than a, uh, a, than a town land. And I know if you're looking up maps or anything, Cullion would kind of be a, a, an equivalent maybe of, of Clock Core. There might be much to it, but there's, it, it, it's known as kind of a community there. I was heard of Cullion, it was a focal point in regards to, from Dunamana to, to New Buildings, you were Cullion in between it. Um, so I do note that, but I do notice there in CTY2A, and I know the officers are recommending that there are three of the six criteria are not met. Now, in your viewpoint, the one I, I see the points that you have raised in regards to it, and I see that you are raising. Sorry, you got my pages there. Uh, number two, in regards to the visual uh, uh, entity, as in the link, and you're coming from the Dollarton Road and from the Kelly Mallet Road itself. Uh, but again, point number three in regards to the cluster around the focal point, that seems to be a sticking point. I'm just wondering if you can kind of uh, draw a wee bit more out of that from your comments. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Alderman Kerrigan. Um, back yourself there, Chris. Well, the focal point, again, thank you for the question. The, the focal point uh, at planning appeals in numerous, uh, if it hasn't got a focal point, it's not fatal. But the focal point in the policy, uh, it doesn't define what a focal point should be. It doesn't say it has to be a building of a certain size or a, a type of structure. What what the plan and appeals and what, what councils seem to uh, have come to the conclusion of, if it is somewhere where the people would identify as being a meeting place, uh, a focal point where people could say, I, I'll meet you at Cullion bus station, I'll meet you at the, the bottom of the crossroads, or I'll meet you at the, the church. That, that seems to be what, what a focal point is. There, there's no definition of size or structure, and, and certainly a bus stop would, would be identifiable in people's minds as, as a place, uh, as a focal point. Thanks, Chris. We'll give it up. Yep. Any other questions? Councillor Jackson. Thanks, Chair, and um, thanks, Chris. Just just a very brief question, and I uh, appreciate that um, you mightn't have an answer, but are you aware of any decision that was taken um, where a bus stop was identified in the fair day as a focal point? I, I have looked into that at, uh, extensively, Councillor, to, to be quite honest with you. and. I can't find where any application used a, a bus stop. There was numerous applications that I found that used, uh, to say the word sketchy, uh, there was things like a river ford crossing had been approved. There was a fish farm approved. There was a, a river itself that was approved. There was a disused graveyard, uh, overgrown graveyard that had been uh, used. And there was a forest walk. You know, it's very, very sketchy what you can use. It's not it's not defined in policy. And, and uh, while I haven't found a bus stop, I certainly think I've found comparable things to it that say, yes, it's not a building. It's, it doesn't have to be a good size. It can be any sort of structure. So uh, hopefully that answers your question, Councillor. But no, bus stop, no. Thank you, Chris. All right. Anybody else? Uh, yourself, Councillor Dobbins? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, Chris, thank you for that. Um, I think the words meeting place would be open to interpretation. 
And um, in my view, meeting place, my interpretation of a meeting place is where, you know, uh, people will congregate for some sort of meeting or, or community facility, you know, that type of thing. Um, uh, a bus stop wouldn't be a meeting place unless you're going into dairy. Um, and a, 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 a rundown church or the remains of what was a church um, would definitely not, in my view, be a, a meeting place. So I think it's uh, that that was open to interpretation. Is there anywhere that would have my interpretation of meeting place? You know, is there somewhere for the community to congregate um, or than waiting on a bus? I think, councillor, when, when you look at the policy and it talks about a crossroads, you wouldn't expect crossroads to be somewhere that people would congregate or people would specifically meet. It, it's the focal point in itself. It's it's an identifiable point. <coughs> pardon me. It's an identifiable point in the community that you could say, I'm, I'm going to call you on crossroads or I'm going to call you on bus stop. It, it, it doesn't specifically have to be a building or a community facility. Um, it has to just be identifiable within the local community. Thank you for that, Chris. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Councillor Dobbins. Um, anybody else before I move on? Okay, Chris, thanks. Thanks for um, presenting that to us uh, and, thanks, answering, thank you. And, and answering those particular questions. So, members, um, Pass it over now for questions to Katrina. There are any. Go ahead, Alderman Kerrigan. Thank you, Chair, for letting me in. And uh, just, just wondering here, Katrina, in regards to it there. Let's see now what I have there. Uh, I, I do see your, your points that you raise in regards to the vital. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, in, in regards to the site, and you raised the issue on the Dollarton Road being from a further distance. Um, but I know, uh, well, maybe that's the way it would have been described as me. And I know what, as, sorry, as, as Councillor Dobbins has touched on there, a focal point, a meeting place. Uh, as I stated before, Collion is more of an area than anything else. And you Blue Bell Avenue which is on the Dollarton Road there. And I mean, it's a, it's a cluster, it's a, it's, a, it's a housing estate, effectively, sitting out the middle of the countryside. I don't know how long that's built or in regards to it, but it's just, that's what it is. Oh, they're making them kind of phone you back after a while. And, and sorry, and it's, uh, so it's, it's in that regard there. So that's, that would have been referenced as... Just, hang on a wee second. Sorry. Can I remind all of those online uh, to have your microphones off if you're not speaking? Uh, go ahead, Alderman Kerrigan. Thank, thank you, Chair. So it would have been referencing into that there that that's more of a, Williams more of an area than a specific uh, narrowed down. It's just, it's, it's the nature of, of, of what it is. But it's the case of you have, you have Bluebell Avenue, which we've been counted as Cullion, you have the hall that's on down the road, on the Duncastle Road, and you have that, you have quite a large cluster well, of houses on the Kelly Mallet Road in there. So I do see that one there. And I'm just Praying on it here. Is there anything in regards to the cluster element of it? It's, it's very difficult to get where I'm looking at it from is to get an actual focal point in Cullion because it's it's a it's a wee bit spread out of it. It's it's the nature of what is there. But I'm querying there in regards as well. You know, you you've pushed it's all right. In regards to the which is that is that point. Point two is the cluster in there. And I know you've got the pictures there. You've a picture from yesterday and, and the hedge is up and it's, it's the time of year. I know when you look on the street view and again, you have the pictures there that were taken when you were out uh, previous when you're doing the report and the hedges are, are well grown up there. If you happen to look on your Google street view going around, hedges are all cut. You can see those houses up behind. You can see number two. You can, you, you know, there is more of a visual amenity. It just depends on the hedgerows cut. For I mean, if you look on the street tree of it, you can see a number of houses on the Kelly Mallet Road from the Duncastle Road. So there is a visual amenity. So, but as I say, I'm still having the issue of the the focal point. Um, but I'm just querying: is there any any aspect there, and even in regards to the 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 third point there, your third refusal reason, and CTY eight and CTY fourteen, in relation to and my view of it there, uh, this site is, is enclosed on three sides with dwelling houses. 
you, you know, you have 114 to the west, you have 100, and, uh, sorry, is it 114 to the west, 115 to the north, and number two, Kelly Mallet to the east. So you kind of are, I'm seeing it with more of a cluster because you have three dwelling houses right around it. But I'm just wondering on your comments on that, Katrina, thank you. Um, oh, yeah, Katrina. I'll start with uh, through the chair. I'll, I'll start with the Dollarton Road thing. So um, I, I basically went back out yesterday just to have it fresh in my head, and I thought, you know, the agent has submitted new photographs, and you know, we're here to fully assess things. You know, I didn't want to say these. I'll go and look and come back. And um, so when I went up the Dollarton Road. Um, it's actually in the townland of Tamna Bryan. <laughs> it's not in the townland of Cullion, where that Bluebell Avenue is. Um, there was one gap. I drove back and forward, and there was one small gap in the hedge where you could see across. But I was looking for it. But it was at a very far distance, and it was heavily vegetated. You could pick out some houses, but to me, doing an assessment, that wouldn't be seen as a cluster of development. Um, the photographs that I took there on Kelly Mallet Road, um, like yourself, I looked on Street View to see when they were. They were taken in 2009 when obviously there was a policy that people cut hedgerows and things. That is not really the policy now, but as it stands and as we've assessed it, um, you cannot see that as a cluster. You know, so, so that's that side of it. So in terms of... Um, CTY8. So um, a, a new dwelling on the application site would extend that ribbon further. You know, there, there's a clearly defined break there and then there's a field. So this that's why we've gone with CTY8 and 14, because it does add to the ribbon of development. And uh, at the time of the appeal in 2019, the PAC commissioner was had a, the, the same view as we did. So basically what happened was it came before the committee, it was assessed and they agreed that it was a refusal under CTY 8 and 14. It was presented at an appeal. The commissioner uh, agreed the same and we've looked at it today again and we're still of the same opinion. Thank you. Is that okay? Okay, thanks Katrina. You all right well, Alderman? Yeah. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Members, there are no other questions. Um, and we will proceed. Um, clearly, the recommendation in front of you um, from officers uh, on this particular occasion is to refuse. Um, members, if indeed that is how you're minded to. Uh, proceed with this, then obviously that's going to need a proposer and a seconder, and if there's any alternative, that's going to need a proposer and a seconder too. So over to you. Uh, I'm not hearing or seeing anyone making any proposals, members. Um, again, I would encourage you to try and help us move this one forward. Uh, Chair, I'm proposing we accept the officer's recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. And a seconder for that. Is there a seconder? Councillor Mooney second, second, second on that. Thank you, uh, Councillor Logue. So the proposal here from Councillor Logue is to accept um, the officer recommendation uh, and seconded by uh, Councillor Mooney. Um, so members, we'll take that now with the proposer and the seconder. Uh, we'll take that straight to the vote. Maura. Thank you, Chair. Members, this is item seven and it's a, it's a vote to accept officer's recommendation to approve. To Sorry, to refuse. Apologies, I'll do that again. This is item six, members, and it's to accept officers' recommendation to refuse. Alderman Alan Breslin? Against. Thank you. Alderman Keith Kerrigan? Thank you. Um, Councillor Jason Barr? Against. Thank you. Councillor John Boyle? Or. Thank you. Councillor Angela Dobbins? 
I'm against Mora. Councillor Paul Gallagher. Four. Thank you. Councillor Christopher Jackson. Four. Thank you. Councillor Dan Kelly. Mora, Dan, sorry, come off a of meeting. No problem. Um, Councillor Patricia Logue. Sorry. Ian McGuire, as apologies. Councillor Philip McKinney is gone. And Councillor Sean Mooney. Four. Thank you. See that is four and four against. Uh, we are taking that. Uh, the reading there is um, five four. Uh, the recommendation to refuse and four against that recommendation. So uh, the recommendation is now considered refused. Thank you. And again, Chris, thanks for um, joining us this afternoon. Okay, members, moving along. Um, item seven for a decision here. Uh, LA 11 2020 forward slash F uh, and a recommendation here to approve. Uh, and Maliki, uh, you're taking that one this time. I'll try not to forget this one, Maliki. Thanks. Thank you, Chair. So item 7 is LA 11 2020 uh, f is a full application for a proposed change of use of part of an existing retail unit or on ground floor level and proposed change of use from office stories to 16 uh, holiday let departments across ground to second floor levels including provision of central courtyard at ground floor and storage and all associated site works at number 9 Strand Road Derry and the recommendation is to approve. Um, yes, the site is located uh, at number nine Strand Road, which is from the, the city centre within the commercial core set out in the dairy area plan. Uh, it's uh, located in a, a prominent uh, retail location leading from Strand Road into Waterloo Place. Um, the attached image shows a, a photo of the front elevation of the, the building um, to be converted. Um, it was formerly in retail use. Uh, it was formerly super trump uh, closed shop and ground floor level, and it was uh, storage associated with that use um, at uh, first and second floor level. And here's some images of the the property from the rear. So the the, the existing and proposed floor plans and elevations are set out before you and are also detailed in the, the case officer report. Um, there will be a retail element um, retained at ground floor level uh, and at, with a small courtyard um, leading to um, left um, access to upper floors and there will be a, a ground floor apartment and the remaining um, short lead apartments are at the first and second floor level. So in terms of policy context, um, the SPPS uh, will contain policies dealing with uh, residential amenity, tourism, uh, etc. We also have a dairy area plan with relevant policies in relation to urban design uh, and the environmental policies, as well as parking and tourism development. Um, we have PPS free in relation to access to public roads and car parking, and PPS six um, in relation to uh, affecting the setting of a listed building and archaeological remains and uh, PPS 16 which has a number of policies dealing with different aspects of the, the tourism um, elements uh, including the principle in terms of tourism developments within settlements uh, and also sets out the particular criteria for tourism developments uh, uh, in terms of the, the various planning criteria and we also have to take into consideration PPS 15 planning and flood risk. There have been a, a number of representations to the application. Um, there have been six letters of objection. Uh, and they've outlined uh, a wide range of issues at, uh, at the early stages of the plan application. 
broadly dealing with sort of procedural issues uh, and then uh, as well as uh, planning issues. So I'll just quickly run through these here. Like, you know, um, the representations raised uh, issues of invalidity uh, in terms of the, the description of the proposal, uh, the submission of some of the documents, including the, the site plan, travel plan, lighting assessment, uh, and just the, the, the completion of the application form. Um, they've also uh, raised issues in terms of uh, certificate of ownership, um, the fee submitted, uh, and they've um, raised issues in terms of the adequacy of uh, information submitted in support of the application in relation to acoustic ses assessment. Um, they've also um, highlighted, you know, issues in relation to who has been, who's been consulted, who's been neighbour notified, uh, and then in relation to the planning aspects of the application. Um, they have raised issues in terms of the, the form of development, um, the scale, height and location of the units um, will be overshadowed by existing buildings within the, the, cent the city centre. Um, issues of light uh, from the courtyard, um, the size of the units and uh, also issues in relation to the policy assessment in relation to uh, PPS 7 and PPS 16. Uh, and again, some uh, comments on the, the facilities contained within each of the units uh, and the uh, associated, you know, uh, storage, et cetera, and service issues. And they've also mentioned HMO standards. So the case officer has considered each of these uh, um, Objections. They are detailed in the report, but again, I'll quickly go through them. Um, the the objections in terms of the description. This has been clarified with by the applicant, and an amended uh, P one was resubmitted with uh, an amended description and was republicised in accordance with with the legislative requirements. The proposal has been accompanied by um, an extensive amount of reports as well, including a flood flood risk assessment, a drainage plan a service management plan, a transport assessment form, a supporting statement and noise assessment, um, which have been considered sufficient information to determine application uh, in terms of um, both for the planning officers and uh, the, the, the range of consultees that were engaged in the application. Um, these submissions, while welcome, they're not required at, at validation stage. So the application was considered valid from the outset um, a transport assessment form has been completed, um, and this the P1 has been updated uh, accordingly, setting out the number of persons and vehicles to be attracted to the proposed development. There's been no uh, evidence submitted by the objector uh, in terms of uh, the, the, the points made in relation to the change of ownership. So there's no valid uh, ownership challenge in the view of the planning officer. Uh, the fee for the application was calculated using floor space and the correct um, fee legislation for tourism accommodation. So officers are satisfied at that point has been attended to. Um, a noise assessment has been submitted. Um, it has made recommendations in relation to specific glazing and ventilation systems, which will be installed for the benefit of the amenity of any proposed occupants of the development. There's been no issues raised um, by the noise report in relation to uh, impact on any nearby residential amenity, uh, sorry, any nearby properties uh, in terms of residential amenity and uh, environmental health uh, have been consulted and have accepted the findings of the noise assessment. Um, up to date plans have been submitted and are used in the assessment. We have consulted uh, Historic Environment Division and both in relation to monuments and listed buildings. And they did not identify any issues of concern and are satisfied the proposal is in compliance with PPS 6. And officers are satisfied it's in compliance with the aspects of dairy area plan also. Full details of the notified neighbours were shown within the committee report and we're satisfied that, uh, that the, this has been completed in accordance with the legislative requirements. Um, the proposal is for tourism accommodation is assessed against the provisions of PPS 16. It is our view that PPS 7 related policy uh, guidance does not apply to this particular proposal. Um, it's considered an appropriate form of development in accordance with policy requirements. In relation to the, the courtyard area, um, officers are 
have reviewed a large glazed void to the uppermost floor is included in the proposal to allow natural light to the courtyard and the building is modest uh, and scaled um, as a three story city. Um, the proposal is not for HMO or permanent residential accommodation and therefore not subject to the Northern Ireland Housing Executive bedroom size standards. Um, and details have been submitted to allow false asset assessment proposal. All objections to the technical detail proposal have been addressed under policy consideration. In terms of consultee responses, we have consulted the FA roads. Um, given the location um, of the development within the commercial core and zone A of the dairy area plan, um, parking is not a requirement. A transport assessment has been uh, a, sorry, a transport um, form has been submitted in support of the application, and a set out how. Um, set out how uh, people can travel to and from uh, the proposed development. We're satisfied that um, that there's no issues in terms of um, roads or access to the site through non-motorised uh, um, methods. And, uh, as again highlighted earlier, historic buildings considered the application will not have any impact on the character of setting of any nearby listed buildings and monuments are satisfied also that it will not have a impact on any nearby monuments. Um, environmental health initially potential identified potential adverse impact as a result of noise. Um, but had had stopped short of request a noise assessment. However, a noise assessment has been submitted. Uh, the assessment did find an increased um, risk of adverse impact to the proposed occupants, but environmental uh, health are satisfied that this can be mitigated in terms of the type of glazing and ventilation system. So appropriate conditions uh, have been forwarded by environmental health and accepted by officers to this effect. And whilst the site lies within the one the 200 years coastal floodplain, uh, a flood risk assessment was required. Um, the nature and scale of um, the proposal also necessitated a drainage plan. TFA rivers have viewed both the flood risk assessment and the drainage plan and have completely cleared the proposal subject to the submission of correspondence from any water accepting the discharge of stormwater, which is a standard uh, issue in relation to uh, drainage assessments. In terms of policy consideration uh, and the SPPS, um, it sets out that there will be a presumption in favour of tourism development within settlements subject to meeting normal planning requirements. Um, these are set out in more detail in both the dairy area plan and PPS 16. So TSM1 allows development and settlement, whereas it of a nature appropriate to the settlement respects the site context in terms of scale, size and design. And proposals must have regard to specified provisions of a development plan. Uh, it's worth noting that there is a second city uh, of uh, Northern Ireland and the, center, the site is centrally located uh, and um, there's a relatively high number of units compared to those as considered appropriate. Uh, it's only if, uh, for a change of use to an existing building, the scale, size and external design are already in place, therefore there will be no impact uh, in terms of additional um, built form. TSM7 sets out specific uh, policy requirements for each in, uh, development uh, in terms of tourism accommodation. Again, the locality of the site is, is important. It's centrally located and it's highly accessible by a variety of transport modes. Um, it's recognised as a reuse of existing building. There's no impact on biodiversity. Flood lighting is not proposed. Uh, no landscaping is necessary. Fund storage is uh, considered adequate. Um, a drainage plan has been submitted and cleared. Um, it's located in an area of town centre, which is well lit and in use during both day and night. Um, so surrounding land use uh, uses include retail and leisure, and the site is proximate to both the Peace Bridge and Dairy Walls. Um, it's considered the location is very suitable for proposed use. There will be no significant impact on character uh, and no impact on landscape quality. Um, the nearest residential development is largely to the rear of the site. Uh, a noise assessment has not identified any concerns with the residents of this development. Again, there's no increase in terms of physical scale, height, or R rates of the existing building. 
Um, there will be some uh, anti visibility in terms of the, the windows to the rear, rear of the apartments to the, the residential properties to the rear uh, at Sackville Street. Um, but it should be noted that the proposed units and collections are on suite bedrooms with no living space. It is anticipated that they'll be used as a base for short term bits for occupants and they will not be in prolonged use in daytime hours. Uh, and it's also worth noting the permitted development allows for conversion of a single flat in, um, in these circumstances. And there's a history of uh, conversion also at the, at the property. Uh, there's no impact on natural heritage. Um, again, we've already covered the, the list of building aspects. Um, NA Water and EH have cleared the, the proposal in respect of emissions and the effluent. Roads have cleared it in respect of access arrangements and parking. Uh, though limited in this street is not a, a, an issue in terms of it being within zone A within the dairy area plan. Um, flood risk has been assessed also under PPS 15. And it's been addressed through the submission of a flood risk assessment and a drainage plan. Rivers agency are satisfied with the contents of the reports. There will be no increase in flood risk and an appropriate uh, flood management plan and evacuation plan has been included in the flood risk assessment. Uh, PPS 6, there's no issues in terms of lust of bald and schedule lines, and we've also considered the nearby conservation area, and, and there's no issues in impact there. So in conclusion, uh, and subject to the conditions in the report, the, the recommendation is to uh, approve the application. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Maliki. Um And again, members, uh, we have a um, speaker uh, to present to us here uh, this afternoon. So can I welcome uh, Robin Nicol uh, to our meeting? Thank you for joining us, Robin. Um, uh, and uh, without further ado, I'm uh, going to pass it over to you now. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. And members, for giving me the opportunity to address committee this afternoon on behalf of my client. I'm going to try and keep this short and sweet. I um, would like to say thanks to Malachi for his presentation, which gives a good overview of the proposal at number nine Strand Road. Um, we think that the proposal for 16 short term holiday let apartments with part retention of retail on the ground floor is a great investment for the city, not only to support the ever growing tourism sector within Derry, especially in such a central location of the city centre, but also to bring vitality back to this vacant property and section of the Strand Road. Um, thanks to officers and stakeholders for their time and effort in processing this application, and we would respectfully ask members to endorse their officers' recommendation for approval. I don't want to hold up the committee any longer, so I'm available to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Robin. That was certainly short um, and sweet, so uh, we appreciate that. Um, members, any questions for uh, Robin, um, either from the floor or um, online? Okay, Robin, no, there's no questions for you as far as I've had an indication. Councillor Logue, okay, go ahead, Councillor Logue. Thank you, Robin. Um, look, in the, the initial application, it is saying that these are holiday apartments. Look, I, I don't know whether, but, but see the plan, as, is there a kitchen area in each of these apartments, or is it just bed space with an ensuite? No, there's no kitchen. It's just sort of tea making facilities, um, just with a bed and then an ensuite. Right. And. Um, can you give a size? I, I can't really make out what size these rooms are. So, um, let me see, sorry. So approximately, um, they're around 196 foot, um, sort of around like 18, 18 square meters, um, ranging between, um, I guess, 14 and 18 square meters. And there is kitchen facilities and a loving room area on the ground floor, is that right? No, there's no kitchen making facilities, no. On the ground floor? No? Uh, no. No. I thought there was a small sitting area. Did I read that somewhere? So on the ground floor, it's the retail, the sort of a reduced um, retail unit at the front. Um, then leading into the foyer area with the lift, um, and then going out to the back to two 
um, separate um, units within plant room area. So maybe that was what you picked up on, maybe it was the plant room, and then with the bin store in the rear as well. So mm -hmm. Councillor Oak, yeah. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Councillor Oak. Thanks, Robin. Any other questions for Robin members? Yeah, I'm on the chat. Angela, uh, yeah, yeah, Angela, uh, you're jumping on me. Angela, go ahead. Hi, thank you, Chair. And um, yeah, I'm sort of echoing what um, Councillor Logos just said. So fe effectively, Robin, these are 16 ensuite bedrooms. Um, where does anybody get the right to call them um, apartments with no kitchens, no sitting areas, um, not even a communal area. Um, I just, I, I can't see how they're, they're holiday lets when basically, you know, they're, you can go to a hotel and just have bed only, you know. Um, so I, why, what was the reasoning for just 16 bedrooms, ensuite bedrooms? So I guess it is, it might, it shouldn't maybe say holiday left, it's short term um, holiday apartments. So it's like that you would have in a hotel, people come and go as they please. Um, and yeah, like so, and sort of Airbnb kind of, um, that was the, the reasoning behind it. Um, just for people, yes, close to the city centre with all of the amenities, close to cafes, restaurants. Um, so the requirement for to make your own food within the apartment it doesn't seem um, required. Thank you. Alan, Councillor Dobbins, are you okay with that? Yeah, Chair, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dobbins. Anybody else, any other questions? Um. Robin, I, I, I'm, I'm just curious, I suppose in a sense, I mean, the, the two members that have spoken before me um, have obviously, they, they've looked at the, the, the size of rooms, et cetera, and, and, and they've quizzed the idea of the fact that there is no, nothing else there except for rooms. Um, I would envisage then that the applicant here is looking at something that would be considered probably low cost and aimed at a particular part of the tourism market maybe i don't know i'm making an assumption maybe backpackers and and people like that uh um or i'm just trying to get my head around why it is similar to the other two members why it is that it's considered uh, a good idea to um simply have bedrooms um i guess because it's so it's so central so sort of all the amenities that you would require are at your doorstep um it's when people go away on holidays, I would do it too. Um, you don't really spend much time at the apartment. You're out exploring. So, um, yeah, I think the size of the bedrooms are as of a good size um, with en suites, some with bathrooms, um, sort of larger bathrooms, and then the tea making facilities. Um, yeah, it's just because it's so it's so close to um, sort of cafes and restaurants within the surrounding area um and shops that yeah it wasn't um didn't seem to be required thanks robin i suppose um in, in relation to that point then you're effectively saying that this is a, this is the kind of accommodation which is effectively like renting a, a hotel room without actually having a hotel yes. um uh, attached or at the ground floor element and so therefore um i, I get that i understand that and of course in, in this central location I can clearly see that there's much um, for people to do uh, and plenty of places for people to eat as well. Um, thanks for that, Robin. So, um, members, I don't see anybody else indicating um, anything. Uh, um, Councillor Dobbins, are you wanting to comment? No, Chair, just put it in. You couldn't get the word. The word was hostile. Hi. Well, um, I, I believe it or not, actually, I, I, when I was a younger man, I did stay in hostels, which had much more than simply just bedrooms. Um, uh, so I don't think I would have described this as a hostel. But anyway, look, you're entitled to your opinion. Um, any questions for uh, the 
Officer, any questions for Maliki members? Um, Councillor Logue. Yeah, uh, it's just uh, on Appendix 7. Um, the second paragraph. Sure, hope I'm, hold on a minute, just. Yeah. Sorry, it makes it easier. It's one page, one four six, and it's actually saying um, at the bottom of that paragraph, it's saying the policy controlling flat conversions. However, this proposal proposed units are comprised of ensuite bedrooms only, with the exception of two units on the ground floor, which benefit from a sitting area and a mini kitchen and therefore cannot be characterized as flats or apartments, so this policy does not apply. So is there units with a sitting area and a money kitchen or not? The, the, the agent uh, said no, but it's, it, it's here that there is two units. Do you mind if I step in? The two units on the ground floor have. Um, I am sorry, Robin. We've we've moved on from yourself. No, uh, that the protocol uh, allowed for questions to you. So these questions are now for uh, the officer. So Councillor Logue's directed that uh, to Maliki. Um, again, the protocols uh, has to be again two at all times. Go ahead, uh, Maliki. Yes, uh, thank you. No, the, the plans before us, um, the ground floor plan, there's a, a retail unit, the ground floor, then there's the, the two uh, apartments, the ground floor, which are on suite there. I was um, like a, a seating area within the, the apartments, like a, like, you know, you put a sofa. Um, now, there, there was earlier um, iterations of plans, I believe, in the application, and that may be um, the point in the report, maybe a, a point that the objectors have raised in relation to what is on the floor plans. But the floor plans that are before the committee are, are, are the ones outlined in the report. Um, so it's not a it's not an, a sitting area; it's a, an en suite uh, as per the other apartments. Like it, so it's, there, there's no such units then. No. Right. See, just on the floor plan, look, I, I don't know about anybody else, but I, I can't seem to enlarge this, you know, to actually look to see. <laughs> um, I um, I say it fails me at times, and, you know, I, I, I don't know whether it's not just this application, but all our applications too, where I've tried to expand. I, I can't do it, and it, it, it sort of hampers you a wee bit and actually looking at, at what you want to look at, if you know what I mean. Trisha, I think, I think an idea, Malik, if you could maybe get that floor plan up there, and maybe you could walk us through it, I suppose. Professor Logue, that might help in some sense, at least we'll see. I think we'll give it a try. That's very, very small on the screen, so we can blow that up. Um, and actually, I did have a question in relation to that too, in relation to the floor plan. If you could actually point out on the floor plan, where's the Strand Road there? That's a good starting point, because I'm assuming the entrance to this is actually from Strand Road, Waterloo Place, Maliki. You see the curse here? Yeah. Um, let me try and zoom on here a wee bit. And... Okay. Okay, it seems a bit lag between my laptop and the screen up here. Okay, so my cursor here now is, uh, that's the Strand Roadside, so that would have been the retail unit here at the front. Uh, so you'll access the, the apartments um, via this area here, um, there by the entrance, there is a, a loft area here at ground floor. This is the, the courtyard area that's referred in the report. So you have departments here. And I think maybe these areas here that you're referring to, there's there's shown on the plans a seating area. It's not it's not visible on that 
floor plan there, but it's, there's a seating area indicated in both those apartments there, and I know with a like a sofa, nice side, and then there's a shower areas here, uh, on suite areas on these floor plans here. Um, yeah, and then see at the back here then is the the beds. Yep. Yeah. Says scenario must be kitchen or dinner. Yeah. Do you want me to share this here on my screen? Mm -hmm. That's what I'll zoom up any better for you, Katrina. No. That this is on the off the portal. All right. Okay. Yeah. If I can maybe share this one. Then. No. Let's see if I can. Just for clarity here, what I think it was appeared to happen here is in the image that's on the documents, the as a, an older version of the floor plans, uh, and the image we have before you here today is the most recent, uh, uh, the most recent floor plans. So that's what's in the presentation. The most recent floor plans. Apologies for the confusion here. So it's the what Katrina is showing you here now. Yeah. So zoom in a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. So this the image on the we have before here is what's in our presentation. So on the ground floor. Again, with the courtyard area, we have two apartments at the ground floor level. Again, these are there's a a key station that's shown in both of these, uh, an ensuite, a uh, bathroom in each, and a bedroom. Um, it's basically like a open plan room with the the tea station and the bedroom in the same area. Yeah, 
And sorry, Malik, I thought you I thought you were sifting through for something there. Councillor Logue, that, that that work for you now? Yeah, yeah, I see it now, but uh, you can see where the confusion has, has come out of. And uh, I suppose that um, the, you know, the paragraph to you is sort of, sort of just leading to uh, a wee bit of confusion there too as well. Um, what... what <sighs> I suppose I just want to say, look, um, why we do need tourist offerings within the city. You know, you, you would like them to be quality tourist offerings. Um, and I certainly wouldn't be describing these as apartments. So are we actually um, assessing this under apartments? Because they're not, for me, they're not holiday apartments. Is the whole application wrong? I just um, for me an apartment is where you cook, where you can sit, where you can sleep, be the whole works like. Yeah. So if you can maybe just want to get this right, like. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Logue. Um yeah, everybody's different. I mean, diff different people want different things. Um Suzanne, you were gonna come in on that, yeah. yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, Councillor Cody or Councillor Logue, I appreciate that. Just in terms of the just for the issue of the plan, so the plan that Maliki showed with no uh, seating area and tea facilities, that's the plan that has been, you know, neighbour notified, and that's the most recent plan. So that that's all okay. Um, take your point in terms of the description. Um, the policy though for tourism is different to the policy we would have for apartments, okay? Um, we're assessing this under PPS 16. So, you know, our normal policy for residential is PPS 7, whereby we're looking for, you know, the, those space standards and all. That wouldn't apply to applications for tourism. Um, tourism short lets. So um, you would have a lesser requirement for space because I suppose the whole issue is that somebody's not going to be in it all day. They're going to be potentially out and about in the city. Um so that's that's but I, I appreciate the description um is 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 you know I can appreciate your question on the back of that. But the plans, you know, we've clearly assessed under PPS 16. Um, there's no implication there in terms of PPS 7. Okay, thanks. Suzanne. Anybody else? Angela, Councillor yeah. Dobbins. Hey, thank you, Chair. Chair, uh, sorry, Maliki. Uh, now, when you have a, a bigger version of of the the map or the the, the dimensions, I don't see no emergency exit. Is is there um is there a fire escape uh, within that? Yeah, um, there is an exit at the rear of the um, of the application site, you know, to the storage area, the bun storage area. Um, there's, yeah, uh, and there's also the front access and the ground floor level also. Um, evacuation will be a matter that will be considered under any application to button control also, but there, there does appear to be two accesses on, uh, at ground floor level to the rear and to the front. I think what I'm trying to get at, is there no fire escape from um, second level then, or third level? Yep, there's a, a stairwell within the site. Thanks, Malika. It's very hard to see it. Uh, okay, thanks, Councillor Dobbinson. Look, I, I, I think we all appreciate the <laughs> it's difficult to take plans that are drawn out in huge sheets and, and, and take them down to these sizes that we're getting presented with. Um, so we just have to work with what we've got, but I appreciate it's difficult. Um, I have the same problems in relation to this one. Um, is there any other questions for Malagy? Okay, members. Um, 
Obviously, there's a recommendation in front of you here this afternoon, and the recommendation is for an approval. Um, before we go to that, I, I just I'm reflecting on some of the things that, that we're probably all thinking. And for me, I was kind of thinking, you know, well, this is aiming perhaps at a, a different type of a, the market. I'll let you back in again, Christopher, when I'm done. But, um, you know, there's nothing to stop a family of four renting the four of the rooms. You know what I mean? Um, and I, I look at this and I think to myself, well, because it doesn't have that, those level of facilities, it probably would be low cost. Um, and not that that's a planning consideration, but I'm just thinking about how this plays out for people who might want to book it as well, you know. Go ahead, Christopher, Councillor Jackson. Thanks, Chair, and um, I'm, going to, I'm going to start by saying I'm, I would be supportive of the recommendation. Um, I, 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 it fits under the strategy um, that this Council has adopted around promoting um, city centre living and living above the shops, um, and, and it does fit on the, the tourism offer. And that, but unfortunately, I had to leave the meeting um, during the presentation, and I wasn't there, so um, I, I wouldn't want to bring the 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 decision and the question. So I'm, I have no option but to abstain and in relation to this. Thanks. All right. Okay. Thanks for that, Councillor Jackson. Yes, you you did indeed, Councillor Lowe, Go ahead. Um, I suppose to concur with that, we have to offer all type of tourism offerings, although just a, for me, a bedroom and a shower room doesn't, doesn't cut it for me, but then, uh, you know, uh, different horses for courses or, or whatever, but how can we get assurances? We, ha we do know that we have um, a deficit of homes within our city and council district. And we we have this whole thing with HMOs and, and then, you know, homes and all the rest of them, which, which they're not. How can we get assurances? And I don't know if we can. And I, I know there is a, a represent or a condition on there to say that they will, won't be long term lets. But how can how can that be placed? You know how how do we how do we make sure that these aren't right? We have this situation. I can offer you four, eight bedrooms. And, you know, there's not even cooking facilities or, or sitting facilities. It wouldn't even be HMO standard. So how can we ensure, or can we ensure that you know that we aren't You know, it would be a substandard delay in a normal situation. Mm. Uh, I, I, thanks. Uh, just I, I can say. I, no, I, I think, I think I know where you're coming from, and I'm sure we all probably do. I don't think you're implying that this particular application would be something like that, of course, but there would obviously be concerns, um, as you see, um, uh, applications come forward, but. I'm sure somebody here, Suzanne, you would you would have a yeah. reflection on that. Yeah, thanks, Chair. And yes, Councillor Log, we we would also we also have concerns about, you know, the issues that we have and what we're facing in terms of HMOs and things like that. What we could do, or what I would maybe recommend that we would do, is maybe make that condition more precise, uh, and make it well. We could add the word temporary. The other thing in terms of the HMOs, um, the process at the minute is whenever so to operate as an HMO, a license is required. Um, the licensing authority will contact um, council and they contact us to see if there's a planning application or there's a history for a approval for an HMO on the site. If there's not, then that will influence their decision whether or not to grant um, a license. Um, if we became aware uh, that this site was operating not for short term holiday accommodation, then we would be looking at it through enforcement. Um, and it really, you know, in terms of the submission of an application, you would need you would need physical changes to that building to make it appropriate to for permanent residential accommodation, whether it's an HMO or it's you, you know apartment, you know long term apartments or whatever. So there is a 
there is a process that we could do, which we which we can do, um, but our only you know mechanism at the minute is really through that condition and the enforcement of it, and then just that that checking in terms of the HMO licensing. Thanks, Suzanne. Okay, uh, Councillor Dobbins. Thank you, Chair. And, and I wish they would stop using the word apartments because that's definitely not what they are. Um, and by the way, temporary accommodation, Suzanne. Uh, the definition from NA Northern Ireland Housing Executive, and as every councillor would know here on on this committee, you know, a temporary accommodation can be eight years. We all know somebody that's on the list. So, um, Chair, with that in mind, I I'm sorry here, but I I think more quality than um than just a bed with uh, with a toilet and bathroom. Um. So um. Therefore. I would propose, I, I'm not accepting the officer's recommendation. Okay, um, uh, you're putting a proposal to the floor. However, I think officers did want to answer, answer one element of, of what you were talking about there in terms of temporary um, as, as opposed to short term. So Suzanne, before we go to the vote, do you want to... Come in with a Thanks, on that. Yeah, it's just Councillor Dobbins, in terms of condition two, which refers it to short lap tourism units, uh, shall be used only for holiday accommodation. It was just a it was just advice from officers to maybe add temporary in there as well. Um, we're not we're not this is not for temporary accommodation for this is only for short term holiday tourism lets. That's all that the, the application is in front of us today for. Thank you, Suzanne. So, um, Councillor Dobbins, in light of that, do you still want to propose um, that we don't accept the officer recommendation? Yeah, Chair, I must have a higher standard when I go away on holiday. But uh, a bed with, with um, a toilet and shower um, just doesn't cut it for me. Okay. So that's a proposal from Councillor Dobbins to overturn the officer recommendation. Um, I'm obviously going to need, uh, if we're going to proceed with that, I'm going to need a seconder. I don't have one in the room, Councillor Dobbins, and unless I see one in the chat, and I'm working on the situation as it is, that there is no seconder um, for that particular proposal, so your proposal can't be considered uh, Councillor Dobbins, thank you. Uh, members, so we've had that one, and uh, clearly now in front of us, we have a recommendation to approve, um, uh, noting that Councillor Jackson um, must abstain, then he can no, he can not actually even make a proposal here. So has anybody else got one for me? I propose to accept the officer's recommendation. So a proposal from... Uh, Alderman Breslin to accept the officer recommendation, and we're going to need a seconder for that. And that's seconded by Alderman Kerrigan. Thank you, Alderman Breslin. Thank you, Alderman Kerrigan. Members, I'm going to get. I'm going to ask Marty to take us through the vote on this one. Thank you, Chair. Members, this is item seven, and it's a vote um, to accept officer's recommendation. Um, Alderman Alan Breslin. For. Alderman Keith Kerrigan. Um, Councillor Jason Barr. For. Thank you. Councillor John Boyle. For. Councillor Angela Dobbins. Against, more. Thanks. Councillor Paul Gallagher. For. Thank you. Councillor Christopher Jackson. Abstain. Councillor Dan Kelly, gone. Councillor Patricia Logue. Councillor McKinney, gone. And Councillor Sean Mooney. Okay. That's seven for, one against, and one abstention. Thank you, Mara. Thank you, members. And Robin, thank you very much as well for. Um... Uh, joining us today and for your patience and waiting your turn. Uh, that's just the way things roll. Um, we never know when people might actually get their, their time in front of us, but uh, much appreciate um, uh, speaking with it. Okay, members. Um, 
I think it's unfair no. to leave them all day and not hear them. Yeah, and folks, I'm said, to... hey, folks, hang on, I'm not finish up. Yeah. Hang on a wee second. Um, what are you saying? No, I just need to take this one because I'll be trying to take any of them. Yeah, it's a big lot of balls. Members on on um on recommendation from officers, there is only one application left with speakers. Uh, they have waited a considerable time to be heard. We did have a short break. Um, I am not dictating to you. But I'm putting it to you that uh, you may well wish to consider to hear this one today. It's entirely up to this committee. So proposed, Chair. The second that Jason Barr. So are you proposing that we hear this now today, Councillor Dobbins? Yes. We've got a seconder there. I didn't hear who that was. Somebody online. Jason Barr, John. Jason. So members, look, there's a proposal there for you to consider. Um Chair, I was rushing home because I do have to go to the hospital, but if you will allow me five minutes to make a phone call, I'd stay for this. Okay. okay. That's what we'll do, Patricia, and that's very reasonable of you. Um, members, let's take a five-minute break and allow uh, Councillor Logue the time to uh, make the phone call that she needs to make. Yeah, share, you know. uh, okay. Oh, that's fair enough. Okay. Uh, right, members. Okay. Thank you to uh, all of those who have um, changed some arrangements to stay with us here. Uh, thank you in particular to Councillor Logue. I know that uh, you have a hospital to visit. Uh, and again, 
we have a number online. If I can encourage everybody to just stick with this one, um, uh, and uh, we'll retain a quorum. Um, and this will be the last one today. So uh, it's item number nine. It's LA 11, 2021, 1264F. And again, Malagi, if you want to present it. Thank you, Chair. Item 9 is LA 11, 2021, 1264F. It's a full application for a change of use from single family dwelling to a house of multiple occupation and a proposed two story rear and side extension to provide six bedrooms overall for proposed HMO. And the application site is located at 12 North End Crescent, uh, Derry, and the recommendation is to refuse. The application site is located within uh, 12 uh, and Crescent here, as shown in the site location, the OS map here. Um, the site is uh, shown as an existing two-story uh, residential property with a front yard and rear yard and a small site extension. And here's a view towards the rear of the site, also showing the, the rear yard area. Um, the elevation of floor plans are set out before you as existing. And here is the, the proposed um, block plan with the area in yellow showing the proposed extension to the existing property at number 12. And again, you'll get an appreciation of the rear garden and front garden area uh, and also. Again, the existing elevations and proposed elevations with the two-story extension, both front and rear. And uh, just a note that there was a previous application considered as a householder application for a summer extension and approved uh, and, the, and assessed against policy PPS7 for residential extensions and alterations. Uh, and here's the proposed floor plans, uh, proposing a kitchen, shower room and bedroom at ground floor level. Uh, and again, an additional bedrooms at uh, first floor level with en suite and two of those. And an en suite as well within the R bedroom contained within the existing footprint of the building at first floor level. So in terms of policy context, um, you'll be aware from previous uh, discussions on applications for HMOs that there is no specific policy within the dairy area plan. Uh, nor, uh, nor any uh, subject policy or plan for HMOs uh, applicable in, uh, in Derry City. So in terms of assessing HMOs rely upon the strategic plan and policy statement for Northern Ireland in terms of uh, impact on character and amenity. Um, we also take into consideration the Derry Area Plan, Policy B, Wonder Urban Design, the, the relevant environment policies, uh, as well as the parking policies within their area plan. And we also take into consideration PPS free in terms of uh, access, parking and servicing to the site. Uh, and in this particular application, we also consider the extensions and alterations under uh, the addendum to PPS 7. So a number of bodies were consulted in relation to the application. Um, DFA roads have indicated that the uh, a requirement of four car parking spaces um, for development of this nature. Um, following the extension to develop the application, the site has space for one vehicle to be parked within the curtilage of the site and thereafter relies on on-street parking to serve this development. Uh, DFA roads have observed that on-street parking is limited in the area surrounding development. Uh, environmental health have no objections uh, provided information um, regarding HMO standards and legislation. Uh, noise transmitted from the occupiers of the HMO to the neighbouring properties and potential for existing noise, odour and disturbance uh, in the area. There have been 13 objections received uh, to the application uh, from seven households. Um, the, the main issues raised was in the objections uh, are related to the carriage of the area. And these relate to um, points in relation to the long-term adverse effects on the nature of the street in the area. 
Um, it's uh, the view of the, the representations, the traditional two-storey semi-detached properties uh, are, are the character uh, at the Northern Crescent. Um, the view is that HMO will be out of character within the traditional dwelling pattern and culture of this model family-oriented development from the 1960s. In relation to parking and traffic, um, the view is that Northern Crescent is already overwhelmed with vehicles parking on pavement. Given the low level of capacity on this one-way um, traffic uh, road system, increased traffic and parking congestion will arise from the proposal. There's a daily illegal parking in the locality, um, which it makes it difficult for various users of uh, pedestrian paths. Uh, and uh, also there's objections in relation to the number of HMOs in areas. Um, there's uh, points made in the level of over-provision of HMOs in the locality. Um, and there's representations in relation to antisocial behaviour arising from the, the nature uh, of the proposed development. And they draw comparisons with similar um, sort of clusters of HMOs associated with universities and other um, settlements. And an issue has also been raised in relation to public safety. Um, given its proximity to the rear access of the Northern Road Fire Station, uh, and the possible congestion, the parking, etc., could uh, um, that could arise from the development. So, uh, in terms of policy consideration, as, as I say, we don't have a particular policy for HMOs within our local development plan, um, nor is there a, a specific regional um, plan and policy statement that uh, uh, deals with HMOs. Uh, therefore, we take into consideration the, 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 the broad planning uh, considerations within the SPPS. So, in terms of impact and character, um, we feel that as officers, the paragraph 2.3 of the SPPS is relevant. It's, it's the basic question is not whether owners and occupiers of labour properties would experience financial or other loss from particular development, but well, our proposal will unacceptably affect amenities and the existing use of land and buildings that ought to be protected in the public interest. Uh, and that adds that good neighbourliness and fairness are among the yardsticks against which development proposals will be measured. Again, uh, and all of relevance to is the advice note in paragraph 2 of DCAN 8, which states that the drive to encourage additional housing in existing urban areas must be not result in town cramming and a situation where un unsympathetic development as a force into established residential areas. Um, so, uh, in terms of our consideration of impact and character, um, our first point uh, of consideration is what is the character of this locality. Um, it's the officer's opinion that there is a, a defined character um, within uh, North and Crescent and the adjacent streets of North and Parade and Drive. Um, which we, we feel is can be uh, defined as one character area, distinct from surrounding areas in the locality. So the character and pattern of occupation in Northern Crescent is a family-sized housing. Uh, despite being relatively close to university, it has remained uh, in, of, of that type and that type of tenure. The properties in Northern Crescent Parade and Drive have remained totally in single-family occupation, According to our, and according to our plan and history searches. Uh, in terms of loss of existing family accommodation, North and Crescent uh, and the, the surrounding streets are medium density residential areas. Um, there have been no other HMOs approved along these streets or no other um, uses that are, um, that are not single family occupation. But the area is characterised by semi-detached properties with reasonably sized front gardens and uh, rear gardens. Uh, the scale, form and character of properties will make these properties suitable for single family occupation, attractive uh, properties um, for, uh, for that type of occupation. Um, we believe as officers that they, these free streets uh, can be distinguished in terms of character from the other nearby areas where HMOs already exist. Areas such as the Glen, Rosemont, and Orphan Road, which um, we believe it's reasonable to conclude that the type of properties existing in these areas may be more attractive for HMOs uh, and less attractive for continued single family occupation, either because of the size, you know, they're too large for single family occupation, 
or they're too small because they wouldn't have the, the, the small yards or no front gardens and they wouldn't be as attractive for single fa family application as they would have been in the past. It's considered in this context that the existing use of land ought to be protected in the public interest. We believe that the public interest in this case relates to the preservation of an intact character of semi-detached single-family occupied homes, which, we, which are unique in the wider context of the locality, and if preserved, will maintain an option for single families in the, the wider Northern Road Glen area. Um, the impact of the HM along the street would unacceptably affect the existing use of land that ought to be protected in the public interest, and it has been concluded so the proposal is not in compliance with paragraph 2.3 of the SPPS. In terms of uh, residential media and impact of nearby properties, the, ne the main concerns are the potential for noise disturbance and impacts on privacy for nearby properties. Um, officers are of the, the view that uh, there's a license scheme where HMOs and should any complaints arise in terms of noise and disturbance from future occupants, that would be subject to uh, a separate investigation through the licensing scheme uh, and, uh, and our authorities. Um, EHD have provided informants regarding noise transmitted from proposed occupiers of the HMO to neighbouring properties. Um, therefore, it is concluded that the HMO would not adversely affect the immunity of those nearby residents and will conform uh, in that regard. In terms of uh, residential media, we've also taken into account the, the physical um, extent of the extension, which was uh, previously considered on a, uh, under an R application and, and in accordance with policy EXT1. The scale, mass and design and external materials proposal were considered sympathetic with the bulk form and appearance of the existing property and did, do not detract from the appearance and character of the surrounding area and therefore were considered to be acceptable. Uh, the proposal will not unduly affect the privacy or immunity uh, of neighbouring residents as, as a result of the physical extension of the property. The proposal will not cause any unacceptable loss or damage to trees or other landscape features, and sufficient space remains within the curtilage of the property for recreational and domestic purposes. Um, parking provision has been considered also. DFA roads have stated the requirement of four parking spaces. Um, a parking survey was submitted by the agent who states that there are adequate parking spaces available to serve the proposed six-bedroom HMO. Um, it is considered the proposal that for this proposal there is capacity to facilitate any additional on-street parking to, to serve the proposed development and therefore um, and, and a reduction in car parking standards can feasibly be delivered also. From the, car, from the case officer's observation on site, um, they concurred with the, the findings of the, the parking survey that there was available parking spaces, uh, on street parking spaces. Um, and they've also considered that the site is in close proximity to uh, you know, public transport corridors along the Northern Road, etc. And it's in quite close proximity to the central area. So therefore, uh, officers are um, having considered the policy MP7 and TR5 of the area, area plan uh, are, are, are satisfied that there's adequate parking provision for the proposed development. There's no issues in relation to natural heritage uh, and uh, although NIH standards fall outside plan and policy, it is acknowledged that this property has met these standards and is considered to comply with standards for size and category of a HMO by NIHE. So, in conclusion, it is the recommendation of officers that if the development is permitted, it would be contrary to the SPPS paragraph 2.3, as uh, the impact of a HMO along this street would unacceptably affect the existing use of land that ought to be protected in the public interest due to the, the, the existing character of the area where properties are still uh, in single family occupation. And the recommendation is to refuse. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Malagi. Uh, members, uh, I have one speaker, uh, Kerry Garraway, on behalf of an objector, Mr. William Doherty. So, Kerry, if you would like to um, present to our committee now, go ahead. Thank you. And um, thank you to Mr. McCarran and the committee for staying on for this case. So, on behalf of my uncle, for the last 38 years, 8 Northern Crescent has been in my family and used as a family home. The area of the Northlands has always been family orientated near good schools, quiet and respectful. 
The proposed extension to the dwelling on the street will see an increase in traffic, visitors and parking on an already busy one-way system. The additional go slow warning signs have been in place at the corner to the entrance of this street as the corner has a slight hill and could be dangerous to both traffic and pedestrians. Already at least 17 cars and additional work vans of residents park in this street and I note that the photos taken for consideration for the decision were taken at a time when the university was not in session and early in the evening when people that were at work were not at home. The street is also a secondary exit for the city's only fire station and ambulance bays. Taxis have a difficulty accessing the street at times where disabled persons are also left to exit cars on the road rather than on the pavement or at a distance away from the residential house. With the proposed dwelling, the increase in the number of residents is suited or geared towards students will see an increase in noise pollution, rubbish and vermin from increased litter. Also the possibility of a police presence due to noise in an area that has never witnessed trouble. This could be due to parties or gatherings at the proposed property that could occur at any time of the day or night due to the garden area. This area is popular with families and already the city is seeing a decline in the available three bedroom family homes that are near good schools. If allowed, this area will see a decrease in property values. In addition, this increase to build will also cause a blocking of natural light to the neighbours properties and a decrease in their privacy. The proposed product project is not withstanding to the property style in the area and would look very out of place in the surroundings. The proposed build would also lead to an increase into this type of dwelling onto the street and the surrounding areas. So therefore, I would ask the council to reject the proposal. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, um, Kerry. Members, uh, open to the floor. Anybody have any questions for Kerry? None in, the, none in the room and none online. Kerry, thank you. Um, and I'm sure the committee will bear in mind uh, your presentation. Uh, one final further speaker, members, and uh, that is Stephen Wade, the applicant. Um, uh, and again, uh, Stephen, thank you very much for joining us here this evening. Uh, thank you uh, for your patience. The, um, the planning committee is a very unpredictable animal. It sometimes takes much longer than we, even we expect it to be. Um, so again, thanks for your patience. So, um, Stephen, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you, and um, thank you for staying on, uh, Lady Lewis. Um, I've owned this property for approximately thirty years, and some of the issues has been raised. I'm very well aware of the parking. There is no issues of parking on the street, and I've submitted the parking uh, surveys carried out various times a day. Um, I lived there for approximately twenty five years before I rented the, the house out, and then. Um, I don't. I don't agree with any of the uh, the, the things that there's been says here about uh, students being uh, bad for the area. Given the fact we've got a student university needing possibly eight hundred students coming to city this year, um, and accommodation in short demand or short shortage for them. Um, I'm not looking to develop this property. The the um, cause nuisance or anything, it's the accommodate the need for the students that we've, we're trying to get to the city. Um, the character of it, I'm, at the bottom of the street, there's flats and mixed use and social affordable and rehabilitation housing. There's a fire station with fire crew parking and sleeping quarters uh, the rear that nightly have fire alarms going off, uh, as in my experience over the years living there. There's a 40 bed hostel for years across less than this is all within 300 meters. So I'm trying to work out where the character of this street is going to be impacted. We won HMO, given that there is um, Airbnb in the street already operating for the last two years. Um, I, I just realized without planning and it's up there for now planning uh, retention on it. But then um, you have the Northland Avenue there with at least seven HMOs on it, um, all been passed recently and um, various mixed use buildings across the top of Craw Crawford Square with rehabilitation centers and uh, for people and homeless people. So I'm trying to work out all these things that's been uh, put forward as negatives instead of the positives of trying to attract the students that we need and, and providing uh, facilities for them. Um, I'm not trying to cram them into a small house and I'm giving them a good sized bedrooms with all the facilities needed, kitchens, um, dining rooms and uh, and en suites in each room. So uh, 
I was trying to just understand how the the, the character's been had so bad with. That's me. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, members again, um, over to the floor. Anybody got any questions for uh, for Stephen? Um, again, Stephen, thanks for joining us. I've I've no indicated questions for you. Um, uh, so, of course, yeah. you're welcome to stick around. Um, and again, finally, members, does anybody have any further questions to Malagi, our officer, who's uh, presented the report clearly? Similar, no questions from the floor. So, members, um, clearly, uh, We've had no questions. We'll move to the next part of the process. There's a recommendation in front of you here. The recommendation is to refuse members. Uh, and again, I uh, leave that in your hands. Professor Jackson. Thanks, Chair. Um, and I suppose I'm going to start by saying that I'm very familiar with the area. Um, I've, I've got quite a lot of family that live in that area um, and I'm only too familiar with the parking pressures that that residents um, and visitors alike experience um, when from living in, in, uh, and along those three streets. I know it was it was um, alluded to earlier that um, these are there is a, they, they're the properties are of a particular character um, there uh, and they lend themselves um, to family dwellings. I know from experience that there's quite a few of those properties that families are decided because of the parking pressures um, that they're experiencing. It, 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 isn't, it isn't as appealing to the families as it once was. And I think an application such as this could further erode that character um, around, um, uh, and, and the character in, in, in that sense is that it, it is, it, it's, it's a largely family oriented um, area, community. So there, there already is um, significant parking pressures an application such as this, or this application in front of us, in my view, would um, would exasperate that um, those pressures. So, um, I, I I've, I've, I'm happy to, to propose that we accept the officer's recommendation to refuse. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Jackson. So, a proposal from Councillor Jackson. Is there anyone wishing to second that particular proposal, either online, uh, Councillor Dobbins? has seconded the proposal and is in support of uh, the officer recommendation to refuse. Uh, bear with me. Um, Councillor Jackson, a question um, from officers actually to you is, would you like the parking matter to be included in a reason for refusal. Yeah. Yes, you would. Yeah. Okay. So members, um, without further ado, uh, we'll put it straight to the floor. Um, uh, and I'll ask Maura now if uh, she could uh, run us through the vote. Sorry, we need a second, Chair. We have a second, Mr. Dobbins. Oh, sorry. Thanks. We were busy checking with the extra reason for refusal, right? Thank you, um, members. This is a vote to accept officer's recommendation, including a further reason for refusal in regards to parking. Um, Alderman Alan Breslin. Not there. Alderman Keith Kerrigan. Councillor Jason Barr. Or Councillor John Boyle. Or. Councillor Angela Dobbins. Or Mark. Councillor Paul Gallagher, I'm not sure if, yeah. 
Four. Yeah, thanks. Councillor Christopher Jackson. Four. Councillor Patricia Logue. Four. And there are other other councillors have gone. Okay, bye. Thank you. So that's the that's seven for unanimous. Thank you, members. Uh, that's unanimous. Again, thank you to Kerry and to Stephen for uh, waiting so long to come to that uh, decision. Uh, and uh, I will now formally close the meeting for tonight, members. Thank you to uh, the seven who remained, the magnificent seven who kept us correct. Uh, and I'll see you all tomorrow. Thank you, Chair. Cheers, Chair.